Good morning, everyone. It is a beautiful day here at Bragg Farms in Tony, Alabama. We are just a few miles away from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and just a few minutes away from the start of the finale of NASA's 2022 student launch finale. My name is Will Bryan with NASA's Office of Communication, and alongside me is Kay Anderson with Northrop Grumman. Now, Kay, it's been three years since we stood in this field watching student rockets take off. What's going through your mind as we're getting ready for today's events? Well, you know, it's just so great to be here in person and the students are so excited too. We walked around and talked to a bunch of them yesterday and they've worked nine months on this project and they're happy to be here face-to-face -face launching their rockets. Absolutely. This is a long, hard process that these teams go through. We're going to get into all of that, including how high these rockets fly throughout today's broadcast. And if you have any questions for us, make sure to tweet us and use the hashtag student launch. We'll try to get to them on social media and on today's broadcast. But before we get to the rest of today's coverage, we're gonna show you a short video about student launch and head over for opening ceremonies. Three, two, one. Welcome to NASA's student launch competition one of NASA's Artemis student challenges. For our student teams, it actually is rocket science. NASA Student Launch is an annual engineering competition designed to introduce students to the exciting world of high-powered rocketry. Student Launch engages students from middle schools to universities in a nine-month engineering design life cycle program, mirroring the activities of a spaceflight program. Teams design, build, test, and launch high-powered rockets and scientific payloads. Teams are divided into two primary divisions, College University, or USLI, and Middle School High School, or SLI. Each year, USLI teams are tasked with completing a unique payload or mission objective. SLI teams are permitted to develop a science experiment or engineering payload appropriate to their capabilities and curriculum. How high do rockets go? For our competition, they'll reach altitudes between 3,500 and 6,000 feet. Instead of trying to fly the highest, teams try to fly the closest to their target altitude, 
which they submit during the preliminary design review, a full six months before their competition launch. A rigorous and competitive proposal selection process kicks off this Artemis Student Challenge. Once selected, competing teams must complete a series of milestone reviews mirroring the NASA engineering design lifecycle. Each review involves preparing a technical report detailing launch vehicle and payload design, technical drawings, simulation data, safety and hazards analysis, test data, timeline and budget estimations, and STEM engagement. Teams present each milestone via video teleconference to a review panel comprised of NASA subject matter experts. To finish out the season in April, teams compete in a final competition launch event hosted in Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama, home of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. For the 2021 and 2022 competition seasons, teams unable to gather or travel effectively are permitted to join the new design division. The design division maintains the focus and technical excellence of the Artemis Student Challenge programs without requiring a rocket to be constructed or flown. If you would like to learn more about NASA Student Launch or other NASA Artemis Student Challenges, visit us at our website or on social media. Visit stem.nasa.gov slash Artemis and see how you can join one of NASA's mission-related student challenges. Good morning. Welcome to NASA Student Launch Challenge. My name is Christopher Blair with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and it's my pleasure to join you this morning. To officially begin our opening ceremony, please rise, remove your hats, direct your attention to the American flag on the silo for the singing of our national anthem by Mason Lee, a senior at Providence Classical School right here in Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free And the home of the Thank you, Mr. Mason Lee. Our first distinguished speaker is a true education advocate. He is the Associate Administrator of NASA's Office of STEM Engagement. Please welcome with a round of applause, Mr. Michael Kincaid. Thanks, Chris. It is so great to be here. You know, at NASA, one of our missions is to involve students in what is it that we're doing, and you're here. Just pause for a second and just realize you're, you're finally here. Think about how much work it took to get to this place, the proposals you wrote, the time you spent in a lab, the things you were working through. It got you to this place. And if you're like me, sometimes I have a hard time just pausing and soaking in the accomplishment and where I am in the moment. Perhaps you're like me where you're thinking about well, what's the next thing I got to do? Is my rocket ready? Is it going to work? All those things go, but I would just ask you just to pause for a second and say, you know what, this is where I'm at. You're, you might think 
that you're sitting here on a farm, and thank you to the Gregg Farm for hosting us, but you're really not. You're really part of NASA. You're at a NASA event. Your friends and family that are watching us back home, they're watching you at a NASA event. And I hope you realize just how cool that is, how most of the country would love to be here and be with you today. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you three ways that you can pay it forward for this experience you've had. First one, it's going to get harder. The first one's pretty easy. Most of you are probably doing it already. And that's find your favorite social media app, take some pictures of your rockets, and pay it forward to the next generation. Because, you know, when people hear from you about what you're doing, it means so much more than if they heard it from us. So I hope you'll be part of that. That's easy. The second one's a little harder. If you're, if you're here with one of the university teams, I'm going to count down, and then I want to hear you as loud as possible if you're one of our university teams, okay? Three, two, one. That's pretty impressive. All right, now we also have high school and middle school teams. I'm going to do the same thing. I want to hear really loudly from all those high school and middle school, all the parent sponsors that are with you. Count down. I want to hear from you as well. Three, two, one. I got to say, there's fewer of you, but you showed up loudly there. Here's what I'm going to ask you. If you're on a university team, it's easy to come in and you're focused. You've got this rocket. You were worried about it. You drove from wherever it is to get here. I want you to pay it forward. I want you to walk around the, the, the areas and find a high school or middle school team and go up and, and, and talk to them. I'll tell you, my 13-year-old daughter is here with me. I asked her last night, we are talking to my wife. Kevin and Mike, thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much for hosting this event. This is such a cool um, activity that we get to participate in each year. Um, the National Space Club is a nonprofit organization um, that seeks to advance excellence in space. Um, we're very much involved with STEM engagement and recognition of excellence in our community. The National Space Club in the last 15 years has given over a million dollars to STEM engagement, which has impacted over 68,000 students. You are part of those students, and we're certainly happy to be a part. You guys have been on quite a journey. We got to hear from some of the students earlier this week in a presentation, and of course they, um, like yourselves, had been through a preliminary design review, critical design review, flight readiness review, months of work, collaboration, teamwork, the kinds of things that are so good for you to be exposed to, and yet here you are on culminating all those events. Now the students that we talked to showed us a picture of a rocket hanging from a tree. Now I know that hasn't happened to anyone else here, but it, it, it's funny, things happen that we do not anticipate. Uh, as Larry said, we often have that sometimes in our workplace as well, and yet some would call that a failure. We call that a learning experience. And we just uh, appreciate your willingness to participate and to be involved. This week is really a, an exciting week in North Alabama and in Huntsville. The process of ex exploration is sort of like a relay race. That's why I've brought two grandsons with me today because earlier this week we had the, the proud opportunity to get to speak with Mr. Charlie Duke as he was here in our community um, celebrating 50 years since the Apollo 16 went to the moon and he was able to pilot a rover on the surface of the moon, the youngest man to ever set foot on the moon, and yet the Artemis program is soon to change that. We're the first person of color, um, the, the, the first female to set foot on the moon here later in the decade. We're just anxious to, to, to join and partner, partner with NASA as we begin a sustained presence beyond low Earth orbit, and you will make that happen. I talk about generations. It's Charlie's generation that came before us. I watched Charlie in middle school and was just amazed at the notion of going to space. Studied mechanical engineering and have had a, a really cool career. It's been wonderful to be a part of the team that helped develop the shuttle, the International Space Station, the SLS rocket, and of course for us at Lockheed Martin, the Orion crew module that sits on top of that SLS this very day 
preparing for a mission here later in the summer. You represent the generation behind us, that third generation that's learning quite a bit from us and, of course, from each other. And, of course, I look to my left, I look to my right, and I hope you will look around today because you'll see lots of children, young people, that are saying, man, it is so cool what you're doing, and can you tell me a little bit about your rocket? My encouragement for you today, take it all in. Look around. Enjoy the time. It goes faster than you might think. Speak to some of these youngsters that are here just absolutely amazed at what you have done. Congratulations on that. We pray blessings for a super day. And ladies and gentlemen, prepare to light your engines. Thank you, Mr. Abel. Your club's work lifts us all up. Let me please take a moment to thank all our sponsors, NASA's Space Operation Mission Directorate, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the National Association of Rocketry, Relativity Space, Bastion Technology, Inc., and Siemens Digital Industry Software. Please give a round of applause for all our sponsors and their critical support. Our final speaker has supported Student Launch for more than a decade and is here to provide our necessary and ultimately important critical safety briefing. Please give your undivided, undivided attention to our good friend with the National Association of Rocketry, Mr. John Lingdahl. So as I sat with you through your many reviews, I think you'd be, you know, shocked if I didn't come with my own checklist. I mean, I, to make sure that I hit all the high points. I think you all know about the hazards, but I want to point them out again. You know, the up, the launch, the boost phase, the coast phase up to Apogee is generally, you know, pretty reliable. It's the, it's the lowest failure mode of the flight. Once the recovery system starts to deploy, you know, we're at the, at the mercy of the winds. So in order to go and mitigate those hazards, we have taken certain precautions. There will be people out in the, the crowd area, forward of, of the, uh, the spectator area, with air horns. If you hear two short blasts, that means that there is a hazard uh, detected. It's not saying it's imminent, it's just saying that something isn't quite going right or it's not going as we would like. So when you hear the two short blasts, you know, look around, listen to the LCO uh, audio. They will give you some instructions as to where to look. Have someone in your group go and locate that and point at it so others can see where it is. If things degrade further, you will hear a long, loud blast. And that is where you get to all the people around you, make sure that they identify what the hazard is and take the necessary precautions. Because we've had 60 years of safe rocketry in this country. We don't want it to end anytime soon or anytime in the future. So your attention to safety is really, really important at today's launch. And um, with that, uh, I will turn the mic back. Thank you, John. What a wonderful time to be involved in STEM education. On behalf of NASA and everyone here today, we wish the best of luck to all teams. This concludes our opening ceremony. We will now move to the next event on the day's agenda, our first rocket launch of the day, occurring in just a few moments. Grab your binoculars, a good viewing spot, and enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. We certainly appreciate all the kind and inspiring words from our NASA leadership and our industry partners. Okay, without them, we couldn't have this competition and be out here today. No, you're right, and we really appreciate being a sponsor. It's our favorite event every year, and it's, that's why it's so great to be back here in person this time. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're about to really wrap up our opening ceremonies with a cool event. Madison West High School, one of our high school division teams, is going to launch their rocket uh, to wrap up our opening ceremonies. Now they've got a really cool payload on board. High school teams can pick a payload of any of their curiosity. 
This particular team picked yeast and sourdough to understand how the yeast and bacteria behave after they go through these high acceleration events and these low acceleration events that they'll hit, ap hit at Apogee. So without further ado, we're gonna send it over to our launch control commentator with the call for Madison West competition flight. Okay, good morning everybody. So we are going to do our inaugural launch for this year's SLI competition. So the first rocket to go is Madison West. The school is, the, the school is Madison West High School out of Madison, Wisconsin. The rocket name is Persephone. You can see it's got a beautiful paint job. It's got uh, blue on there and it's got a lot of 3D printed stuff on there. 3D printed nose cone, transition, and some internal parts. This rocket weighs 33 pounds, five and a half inch diameter, eight feet tall. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, eight feet tall and does have a four inch diameter as well. This does have 3D capsules for petri dishes filled with sourdough and yogurt samples to study the effects of rocket flight on the fermentation process. So this one is a food flight. I also do know this rocket is projected to go about 4,000 feet. So this motor is flying on an Aerotech K1999. Does have electronics on board. Main is set for 700 feet. For those that don't know the motor, this is a K close to a K2000. When you do the conversion, it's about 450 pounds of thrust for a 33 pound rocket. So this will be a nice good morning flight for, for many of us here today. So right now we have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We have Jill Esco of, at, with Northrop Grumman doing the commemorative button push. So thank you for joining us, Jill, and thank you, Northrop. We are going to launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. I said good morning. OK. Woo! All right. We've got to start an arc over. Looks pretty close to that 4,000 yeah. feet. Should have an event yeah. here. There we go. There it is. Yeah, I see Let's it. Let's hope that sourdough's okay. I see it. Kind of hungry already. Just thinking about food. Yeah. You can see that little smoke that the traffic came up from the motor. So folks, this does have electronics yeah. Yeah, on board. Yeah, my camera's tilted all the way up, so I see it in the top of my frame. So for all those barely. looking, you kind of get a sense of what the, uh, the yeah. wind will do for the launches. So if it's nearby, this is a good, yeah. like, good practice. Oh shit. You're never supposed to point because it's rude, but this is the time when you can. Heads up. Heads up on this one, folks. Heads up. Point at it. Look at it. Let's be able to go. There we go. safe touchdown that had a great parachute deployment yeah, got goodness. close to the crowd so it's <laughs> always important for us to to stay uh, aware and be uh, aware of what's going on when right. these rockets fly right uh, i like how everybody like points to it and so every, if somebody doesn't see it they at least know the direction it's coming down and, and that's right? one of the really important things that they discussed in the opening ceremonies are all the safety precautions that you have to do when you come out here many of us have launched right. Uh, have, as the wind starts picking up here, many of us have launched the SD's rockets that fly maybe a thousand feet up in the air, and they're a lot of fun to do. These are a different realm of, of different class of rockets. So how, how high do they go in altitude? Yeah, so these rockets are targeted to fly between 4,000 and 6,000 feet in altitude. As you probably heard in the video, these rockets, uh, these teams are scored on a number of different criteria, and they're given a lot of different awards and categories, including the altitude award. Now the altitude award is given to the team that comes closest to their predicted altitude. But Kay, 
They don't they don't predict this altitude this morning, do they? No, they do it about nine months ago before they even start building their rocket. They get it all down on paper first and they predict within eight feet sometimes how high they're gonna go. Absolutely. So tons of simulation goes into this. These teams know their mathematics and they know the physics of what makes these rockets fly better than better certainly better than I know it. <laughs> well uh, and so I'm really excited to talk to the teams about how they came about figuring out their altitude. Yeah absolutely I'm excited to hear that too. The other cool thing we'll, we'll get to you uh, today is how they actually figure out what the altitude award is. These uh, are what the altitude is. These teams fly yeah. altimeters on the rockets. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so they have uh, they have important measuring devices and that our trained professionals will listen to different beeps and um, they'll be able to determine how, fly, how high the rocket flew. But rockets, whether it's out here at Student Launch or with NASA in the space program in the space industry, it's not just about going high. They have to carry payloads. We discussed it before this rocket flew that the high school uh, division gets to create a payload of their own creation. Our college division teams, which you'll see throughout today, they are issued a challenge from NASA. Specifically this year, they're trying to mimic how do we find out where a spacecraft on other planets land when there's no GPS. Yeah, that's just crazy, and a couple of them had some really great different ideas yesterday. I can't remember them now, but we'll talk to the students throughout the day. Absolutely. You're going to hear about how these teams tackled it. How do you figure out where a rocket lands when you don't have GPS with you? Now, Madison West is out there uh, about to recover their rocket. We've got some other teams going up on the rails. One of NASA's goals is to engage and inspire the next generation. And that's truly what we do here with NASA Student Launch. Part of one of the many ways that we do that is also with our social media. We are bringing this stream to you live on the NASA Student Launch Facebook and the Marshall Space Flight Center YouTube. If you have any questions for us, use the hashtag Student Launch. You can tweet at us, put it in the chat. We'll try to answer them while we're live there on social media and maybe even answer your question here on the broadcast today. So as our teams are going to be coming up and down. One of the other things that, that I want to talk about is just the amount of work that goes into it for these teams. We've mentioned a couple of times the many months right. of work. Right, and one of the speakers this morning talked about that it's just like a real rocket launch and NASA is getting ready to, to launch the Artemis rocket in just a few months and the teams go through the same process that NASA does with their pre-flight reviews and the launch readiness reviews and all the acronyms that make those reviews up for nine months, just like a real rocket. Yeah, absolutely. It all starts with a proposal way back in August. NASA Student Launch releases the handbook. Teams look at the handbook, look at the requirements, build a proposal, submit that, and they have to be accepted. It's not a let's send in our homework and we get accepted type thing. They submit it. And then what follows are months of designing and building and testing a subscale version of the rockets you'll see out here today. Then they build, test, and fly, and in some cases, as you'll hear today, repair their flight rocket. And all along the way, okay, they're, they're writing hundreds of pages of reports, they're doing uh, reviews and presentations with NASA rocketry experts. Right, so what we see today is the fun part, right? But they've had eight or nine months of the not fun part, but really super interesting <laughs> and learning for their future, right? Absolutely. And I'm admired, like I admire the high school students because there's no way in high school I was gonna be Forget understanding what's going on out here. The reports and the presentations is a daunting project, especially right. when that's what you do after school. Right, it's, this is for fun, <laughs> this hard work. And so we certainly appreciate it. Now we're seeing about 27 teams out here with us today, but we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge our other teams. Many of the teams, for whatever reason, were not able to join us out here at NASA Student Launch. They're going to be flying from their home fields, making their competition flights with other NAR-sponsored events. So to all of you teams watching at home, we say hello, we wish you were here, and we wish you the best of luck. And for all the audiences back home, make sure you follow all these teams on social media and see what it's like to build a rocket through their perspective. Now, as we're getting our next teams um, out on the launch rail and Madison West is recovering their rocket, we're going to send it up to the wide view shot, take a quick break, and we're gonna be back with you with all the actions, including interviews with our NASA leadership and with these teams just shortly. Thanks for joining us for the 2022 NASA Student Launch Finale.
Good morning, everyone. We are back with you here at Brack Farms for the NASA 2022 student launch finale. We are joined now by the team from Purdue University. Purdue, you guys are getting ready to fly. How's everything going? It's going pretty well so far. We've, we've had a couple of snags that we've worked out once we got to Huntsville, um, but we're really happy with uh, where we where we brought the rocket and we're, we're ready to launch. Excellent. Now, you guys are, are a team that's here year after year. and we, we love seeing you out here. Winners of the 2020, uh, 2020, I believe, Social Media Award. What's it like being um, having that underneath your belt? It feels really great. Um, I always love looking back on all of our past photos. For me, it's really inspiring um, for this year to keep going, especially when we hit snags. Um, it's super fun to be back in person, finally. Well, we love having you back. Now, for teams or for anyone at home wanting to follow you on social media, how can they find you? We are PSP Student Launch, Purdue Space Program. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Excellent. Yeah, I have one, one last thing. They have 130 team members, I believe. Is that right? So we do have anything to say to the team members that aren't able to be here? We miss you guys. We wish you could be here. Thanks for your work. Now, thank you. Before you go out to fly, any sponsors, any professors, anybody back home you want to thank for? I know your, your other team members, of course. Anybody else you want to thank from back home? Yeah, of course. We, we want to thank the, the aero department, the mechanical engineering department, and the uh, electrical and computer engineering department. Uh, they've been a lot of help with resources and, and money and all that, and we're, we're really appreciative to, to all of them back at Purdue. Super. So to all the departments back home, we certainly appreciate Purdue, a long history, a great history in engineering. Uh, names like Neil Armstrong and Gus Grissom call Purdue home, and these uh, fine young people do as well. We wish you guys the best of luck as you go out there. Have a safe flight, have an awesome flight, and uh, we'll see you guys afterwards. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck with your launch. Thanks. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> hey, Ron, we are back. Hey, we've got Granada Hills High School from Granada, California. I'm joined here with Enzo. Enzo, you guys are getting ready to fly. What, what's going through your mind? How are you feeling? Well, we're feeling pretty nervous. Um, obviously, it's been a whole eight, nine months we've been working on this project, so a lot kind of culminating today. But we feel confident. We've gone through our checklist. We've inspected the whole rock. We've flown it a couple of times now, so we're confident how well it can perform, just hoping that everything goes well today and we see a nice flight. So what's your payload on board? So our payload on board is a scientific payload that will measure atmospheric conditions and we'll use that to determine the possibility of environmental sustainability for various forms of life such as potato life. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you got to have potato life, right? <laughs> hey, I, I like my mashed potatoes down here. <laughs> hey, so is this your first time, your team's first time participating in the student launch? Yeah, this is our first time participating yeah. in the student launch. Uh, definitely been an adventure, definitely been a learning experience going through the whole 
design lifecycle process for the first time, going through the proposal, all the reports, and now kind of seeing how it all culminates is really, really exciting. But yeah, it's our first time, and I think all the members of the team can definitely agree it's been a very fun learning experience for all of us. So y'all are up for it again? Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, I'm definitely up for it again. I'm graduating, but I know a lot of them are going to stick around and hopefully continue this program in the community. So Super. Yeah. That's great. Now, how high are you guys targeting to fly your rocket today? So our official target altitude is 4,700 feet. That's impressive, almost a mile up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's incredible. Well, so is there anybody back home you want to thank any teachers, any sponsors that helped you guys get here? I know it's a long way from California to North Alabama. Yeah, it's um, definitely been an adventure. We'll obviously like to thank um, our mentor, Mr. Swanson from Lockheed Martin. Definitely like to thank him for everything he's done, everything he's taught us. Our team educator, Celia Sellis, for being very on top of things, keeping us organized, very amazing. And to our sponsoring organization, uh, the one who made this whole team possible, AYSO Region 174. We couldn't find anyone to sponsor our team. Luckily, they stepped in. It's been we're very grateful for them. And then all of the families and friends of the team members who helped us get to this point, from all the launches to all the workshop days. We want to thank everyone out there who helped us get here today. Awesome. Now let's roll your rocket and we'll get these. Uh, I see these sponsors and these stickers up and down here. So to everybody back home, thank you uh, for your support of these young people and the incredible work. A first year team all the way from California joining. Guys, we wish you the best of luck and we hope to see you again next year. And congratulations on, gradua on uh, graduating. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. That's Granada. Thank you. That's Granada Hills High School from Granada Hills, California. They are going to be on their way to the rocket. Uh, on, the, on the way to the launch rail to, to launch their rocket that's going to study the atmosphere. Now, okay, I think it's one of the really cool things about this competition is we talk about the altitude, and I always like to think of Babe Ruth calling their shot. You guys <laughs> called, they called your shots a few months ago. But in certain conditions, we're actually targeting specific altitudes, just like we do in the spaceflight industry. Got to get the payload to the right orbit to get the right science. Right, so what all went into you guys being able to determine how high you're going to go and how do you predict you're going to get exactly to the altitude you, you've selected? Well, we've flown this motor, um, this rocket before on the motor. We're going to fly it today. We've gone pretty close. We've flown to about 4,600 feet. Our predictions is that we might go a little bit lower because we know we're a little lower altitude, so the air density down here might bring uh, our rocket's yeah. altitude down a bit, but hoping to get at least a good 100 to 200 feet within the range. Super. Mm -hmm. And so, so while we're talking to you about that, what are the things that go into factoring how you figure out how high your rocket's going to fly? Well, we definitely got to, We definitely had to keep the weight down. That was definitely one thing that we had to keep in mind. We also had to run various simulations when we wanted to determine the drag coefficient. That was a very big issue for our team. Uh, you know, on the ascent, it was obviously a big issue, but even more so on the descent, we we're trying to get that descent time down. I'd say those are the two primary factors we had to keep in mind when we were trying to dial in on this design and get it to the right altitude. Excellent. Well, guys, we're going to let you head out to the launch rail. Thank you for joining us today. We can't wait to see your rocket fly here in just a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank ah, you. Thank you. Good luck. That is Granada Hills High School from California. Now, you guys are seeing student launch, and we're going to uh, – student launch is one of the many ways that we use to inspire and engage the next generation. I want to bring in our next guest, uh, a dear friend and a longtime colleague of mine, to talk about one of the more unique uh, products. Thank you, Will. So joining us now is, Amanda's, is Amanda Adams, as I mess up your name, sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, Amanda Adams is here, gonna, is here to talk to us about First Woman, an interactive novel. Now first, Amanda, tell us what you do with NASA and then also what is First Woman? Sure, so I am the STEM Engagement Coordinator for NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate and we have just put out pretty recently First Woman, which is NASA's first interactive graphic novel. This novel is loaded with interactive content uh, where you can learn about real NASA technologies that are helping us learn to live and work on the moon. And it follows our fictional astronaut, Callie, who is the first woman to walk on the moon. Now, Amanda, why is it important for NASA and our Space Technology Mission Director to do products like First Woman? Sure, so we are very interested in engaging the next generation of space explorers, our Artemis generation, as we prepare to return to the moon with, with the first woman and the first person of color. So this, uh, this tool will engage students and be able to scan through QR codes to access inter, uh, interactive material in both English and Spanish. So we're really excited to use this tool to uh, get it into the hands of our next generation of astronauts and uh, people like us, Will. So Amanda, I know I'm going to get my copy and, and nerd out over it. 
uh, for anybody wanting to get a copy of it and get their hands on First Woman, where can they find it? Absolutely. You can find, uh, you can download a copy of the novel at nasa.gov slash Cali first, or you can download the app that has full of, of interactive features like you can walk through a life size, life size scenes from the story, as well as uh, access virtual realities inside the space station. Um, you can download that app, the First Woman app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. That's awesome. Now, Amanda, um, we're getting ready to, to send the first people uh, back to the moon for the first time since the Apollo 17 mission. A first woman is surely to, is going to inspire that Artemis generation who's going to take us there and then on to Mars. Thanks so much for coming out uh, and hanging out with us this morning. Thank you, Will.
Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. We are joined uh, by with another team. And Kay, one of my favorite things about Student Watch is the paint jobs and the names of the rocket. We've got you know, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Tommy's here joining us. Tommy, first, tell us what the name of your rocket is. We have Wow E. Wackett Senior here, the third. <laughs> okay, so if there's the third, there's probably a story about why there's number three. Oh, no, this is just the third launch. Third successful launch today is going to happen, wow. uh, and we're really excited about that. <laughs> That's awesome. So what's the experience of NASA Student Launch been for? Been like for you and your team? Uh, it's a lot of stress. It's a lot of uh, character building. Uh, and it's, a, it's a lot of opportunity <laughs> to grow and improve and enter industry as uh, experienced engineers that, that we need to be. But, but what about all the fun that you're having? Oh, well, yeah. Rockets are fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned um, all the engineering. What are any classes that have really helped you um, get with this competition? Yeah, for sure. So, so advanced fluids or um, uh, gas dynamics is, is definitely a very useful class. You, you learn about air and how it interacts with, with aerodynamics. Uh, mechanics and materials, statics, dynamics, they're all playing uh, key, in, key roles in our design and our creativity. Uh, and also uh, excellent classes in design and uh, creativity uh, led by Dr. Elliott, uh, who, who helped foster our creativity and uh, help channel that engineering into actual real world solutions. You know, I think that's really interesting. You mentioned the creativity. A lot of people think engineering is, is math and it's physics and, you know, it's kind of a rigid discipline, but the reality is quite different, isn't it? Yeah, engineering is, is mostly about creativity and then taking that creativity and bounding it in. So starting big and coming in small to a real world application. Now, talking about creativity, I know the payload challenge this year is, is quite a challenging one. How have you guys tackled that and what is your payload uh, system like to, for that challenge? Uh, so we're going to be using feature matching, uh, using SIFT algorithms. Uh, it's a big linear algebra puzzle. Um, and we're also going to be running with a RF trilateration approach uh, as verification for our main payload. And so we're really going to have two separate systems verifying one, each other, just like in the real world you'd have two systems. Well, that's awesome. Guys, your rocket looks great. I can see your entire team looks great. Um, before we let you go, anybody back home you want to thank? Any sponsors, any professors? Yeah, first of all, Dr. Elliott, our main faculty advisor here, as well as Dr. Gary H. McDonald, uh, Dr. Margraves, uh, the Baja team, uh, especially for lending tools and supplies to us, but for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, y'all, we're going to be seeing their rocket launch later today. Um, hi, this is just awesome. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a another rocket down here by the actual engine. Um, so we're going to be able to see some cartoon, some creativity, and some engineering all uh, come together today at the NASA Student Launch. Guys, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much for coming out here and joining us. Thank you. All right. That is the University of Tennessee Chattanooga.
Hey, everyone, we are here with Central Washington, one of our rookie teams this year. You guys came all the way from the Pacific Northwest to join us here in Alabama. Uh, Henry, we met yesterday. You guys, your Rockets out there on the rail. What's kind of going through your mind as you're getting ready for this? Uh, just feeling really stoked about it, feeling really confident. Uh, we've done everything we can. We feel really good. Testing's gone well. Everything feels good. The nerves are always here, though. You know, the button, it always makes you nervous. But feeling really good, nervous, excited, really happy to be here. Absolutely. So this is your first year participating? Yes, this is our first year participating in any capacity in the student life. So tell us about the challenges of being a first-time team and not having a base. Oh, it, it's a been a ride. Um, a, a lot of the things we went into it and found very quickly that, oh, this is a lot bigger than we thought. Um, I think when we first started this project, uh, it was a little email that came from our advisor, Dr. Darcy Snowden. Uh, she sent an email and said, hey, if you guys want to do this, go ahead. If you don't, don't want to, yeah. And uh, then it turned into a whole beast. But uh, it's been an adventure. We've learned a lot. Um, the scope of things is beyond anything I think any of us imagined, but very pleased. Yeah, that's yeah. how we suck you in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, so speaking of the scope of things, how have you guys tackled this year's payload challenge? Yeah, so we went with a visual tracking method. Al, if you want to talk about it. Sure. You... Yeah, so we decided to go with a visual tracking method. We went with a uh, Pixie 2 cam. Um, it was intended for like very close practice. So we had to get creative with how we used the information that we got from it. We decided to go with extremely obnoxious colors, if you can see over there <laughs> on our tent, um, to get about, a street, uh, about as steep a color gradient as we could possibly ma uh, manage um, to increase the probability of the camera actually seeing our target. Um, and then through just a couple of linear transformations and uh, trigonometry, we were going to be able to detect a distance, um, a location on the grid, and just uh, hopefully get as much information as we can. So your rocket tent, your, your pits, pit box essentially, is part of uh, your rocket success and your payload. Exactly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's awesome. Um, so do you guys, what did you name your rocket? Uh, we've actually named our rocket Newbie. We're a first year team and we thought it'd be a cute little thing to name it Newbie. Uh, we have a little bee drawn on like the top of the rocket, you know, holding on. Uh, <laughs> uh, nice fun little addition. But we've named it Newbie and we've named our tracking method Avatar, uh, which is short for a visual analysis tracking of a rocket. Um, Awesome. Aptly named. Okay, okay they, you can tell they're true engineers. You guys are ready to join the space flight industry. Yeah. Yeah. You are already working the acronyms in that way. Oh, that, that's quite impressive. So how many of y'all are six and to graduate, and how many are coming back next year? Uh, I believe five or six of us are graduating. Um, haven't really talked about next year. We're getting through this year first. Like having a baby. Yeah. <laughs> get, get, get through this one first. It yeah. Is a, it is a flying baby. I haven't had a baby yet, but... <laughs> Get through this first. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> well, so guys, we sure appreciate you coming. What's been the, the highlight for you guys coming down from, from Washington North Al? I know it's a little bit different world down here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit different terrain. I'd say, I'd say the highlight for me has been meeting the other teams. Everyone has been so incredibly kind and helpful for things that we weren't able to bring just through flying, like yes. extra duct tape. Yes. Um, we've ran into some really wonderful teams and just wonderful people to talk to. They've all been super sweet and helpful along the way. That is really nice. You can't make a rocket without duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> the duct tape's really tense. <laughs> they're, they're truly getting the engineering uh, perspective and the, the, the right practices in place early. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming out here. We're so thrilled to have, we love all of our teams. The rookie teams have a special place in my heart because I know how big of a task this is for you. Best of luck in today's launch, and we can't wait to see your rocket fly. Yes. Thank, Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Appreciate All right. That is the University of Central Washington, one of our rookie teams. They're going to be flying here. Their rocket's out on the rails right now. They're going to be launching here shortly.
Hi, welcome back to, to uh, NASA Student Launch. We're gonna to talk to Madison West High School. They were our first launch of the day with their rocket named Persephone. High School, they were our first launch of the day with their rocket named Persephone. Tell us a little bit about how the launch went. Um, it went great. Um, it was a super huge honor to be the first launch today. And it was really gratifying to see everything work as planned. So I didn't have you introduce yourselves. Tell us who you are. Um, I'm Julia Lee. We're from Madison West High School in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, we'd like to hear a little bit more about your payload. You had a more interesting payload this year and you had to go take care of business after the launch to see how it worked. Yes, um, our payload has sourdough starters and yogurt inside, which both have bacteria in symbiotic relationships, which means that right after the launch, we had to put it right back in our cooler. <laughs> that is terrific. So what, what results did you see immediately? Um, our project actually studies the more long-term results. Um, to really see the effects of the flight. But. Okay, gotcha. So tell me, how long has your team been coming to Student Launch? 17 years, since about 2005, I think. Five longer than me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If that, uh, this competition's a little over 20 years, so Madison West has been coming pretty much all of those years, and uh, we love to see it. One of the uh, fascinating things is you talked about your long-term payloads. It's one of the things that we do with NASA is we have payloads and we don't always get the data right away. A lot of time it's a little bit down the road. Now I see your rocket has a bit of a unique shape. You've got um, a taper up there in the mid part. Uh, what's the reasoning behind that taper and uh, what went into making that decision? Um, we have a transition in our rocket because we needed the space for the payload in our bottom booster section of the rocket but wanted to be able to deploy our parachutes easily with the smaller diameter. So now talk to us about the paint scheme because uh, it's glittering here in the sunlight. It's a beautiful rocket. Uh, did, who painted it and, and how did you guys come to this design? Um, I painted it or the team kind of came up with the idea. We wanted to mimic our mission patch and kind of emulate our project name, which is Persephone because of the cycles and fermentation and we kind of went for night and day transitioning from the night and the stars and the glitter to clouds and flowers on top. <laughs> Y'all, it's a beautiful rocket. Um, I love it. So it's not all science and business. It's a little bit of creativity and art, yeah, of course. right? <laughs> well, guys, that is Madison West. Thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for getting your rocket ready so we could have a really awesome start to the day. It was a beautiful launch. We love seeing it, it fly and, and come down. Thanks again for joining us here, and thanks for always coming back, and we can't wait to see you next year. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That is Madison West High School from Madison, uh, Wisconsin, one of our perennial uh, high school teams.
Hey everyone, we are here with James Madison University. Kay, one of our rookie teams, the first year coming out. Yeah, we just had another rookie team. I'm interested in hearing if they had a similar experience. What was it like being the first year team? Uh, it was great. We've been working on this as our capstone project through our engineering department. So uh, we've been working on that for the past year and a half or so. And yeah, it's been a great experience. We're so glad to be here and uh, meeting everyone has been awesome. So now that you're at the end of your first year, Anything that you would do differently uh, maybe for next year or advice you would pass on to the next generation or the next year's team? Sure, yeah, we have a junior team coming up next year, so they'll be here again. Um, and I would say just stay with it, keep working. It's a lot of work, but uh, it's definitely worth it, so stick to stick to it, yeah. So is this team all seniors? You're, you're ready to graduate? Yes, yes ma'am. Oh, so you're just going to toss it off to the next, <laughs> next year. That's great. So how did you guys tackle this year's payload challenge? So we're using two IMU sensors that take acceleration and gyroscope data, and uh, we integrate that down to a position, and that'll tell us what grid location we're in. Now, for anybody back home or a certain host, what is an IMU? So an IMU is basically a sensor, um, and it just takes acceleration readings and gyroscope. That's Easy peasy. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not rocket science. <laughs> um, so guys, what's the, I know we kind of touched on it, What's been a highlight of this experience for you uh, as a first year team? Yeah, definitely everyone we've met, um, all the support we've gotten from everyone back home and just seeing everyone kind of buy into our project as a first year team has been really awesome, really rewarding. Now you mentioned all the people back home, anybody you want to thank, any sponsors, any professors, any uh, family members? Absolutely, Dr. Holland is the best. He was our capstone advisor. Um, we're very grateful for him. Dr. Noggle, our teacher, Chuck, who's out here with us, our mentor. Um, and then just the whole engineering department. They're actually having a symposium right now, so we'll say hi to everyone back home. Yeah, so to everyone at the James Madison University <laughs> Engineering Department, hello from NASA and Student Launch and your awesome <laughs> rocketry team. Um, guys, so you guys are all seniors, about to graduate. What's next? Um, we have a couple of folks going to grad school, a couple working at big aerospace companies, so definitely bright futures and student launch has opened a lot of opportunity in the uh, aerospace field for us. So. Well, Northrop yeah. Grumman's recruiter is right over there. <laughs> <laughs> well guys, thanks so much for coming out here and joining us and, and talking, with us for, talking with us for a few minutes. Know your rocket's out there in the pad. Uh, we can't wait to see it fly. Thanks for coming out. We can't wait to, uh, to see you joining us out here one day uh, from the NASA side. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> that is James Madison University, uh, one of our teams that's going to be flying here shortly. Hey everyone, we are joined by UAH, the University of Alabama Huntsville, a hometown team, which we always like to see out here, but a team that's been coming for many years, but you guys, it's all of y'all's first year uh, here at Student Launch. What has your experience been like? It's been amazing. We've been able to build a rocket from scratch and we're all excited to be here. So Alice, we didn't really let you introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us your name and where you're from. 
I'm Allison Lentz and I'm the safety officer here. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I came all the way down to UAH to participate in our rocket program. So how long have you personally been interested in rocketry? I'm kind of interested in how y'all came to do this. I mean, I've been interested in it since I was a kid. Space was always my favorite thing as a child. And then I saw those, um, those big rockets at Kennedy and I knew that I wanted to do that. That is super. Those big rockets at Kennedy are always <laughs> impressive and they're amazing to watch launch. Now as a safety officer, what is your role on the team? I look over the safety of the design, testing, and launching of this rocket, and it's been awesome. My whole team has really helped me develop all of our safety paperwork and stuff. Lots of checklists, I would assume. Yes, I got my checklist right here. <laughs> <laughs> now, so your payload challenge, I know this is a difficult payload uh, year. How did you guys approach that? I'm going to pull one of our payloads right here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, come on in and introduce yourselves as well. Uh, my name is Adam Garrett, and I'm on the payload team. Yeah, I'm Declan Brick. I'm also a payload team member. All right, so now your safety officer brought you guys up here to talk about the payload. What's on board that rocket? Uh, yeah, we have an uh, inertial navigation system. Um, so basically it just consists of some accelerometers and gyroscopes, um, and that just tracks the rocket during flight. And then uh, lots of math later, we uh, get our position. Excellent. Now, what, uh, what target altitude are you guys aiming for? Uh, 4,300. 4,300. So over 4,000 feet in the air. I can't even um, imagine that. Um, so you selected 4,300 feet. What, um, how close do you think you're going to come today based on your test flights? We'll get up there. We'll get up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get up there. Don't you worry. You're not going to give us a range? Uh, probably well, over 43 at least. Like, okay. 43 is probably minimum. We don't want to go under. Excellent. Now, I uh, understand you guys have a lot of sponsors, a lot of support that helped you get here and build this rocket. Anybody you want to thank? Uh, yeah, I'd love to thank our sponsors. That's Jacobs, uh, the National Space Club, the Alabama Space uh, Consortium, and uh, I, IS4. And I also want to thank all of our advisors that have helped us through this, Dr. Lineberry, Dr. Patel, and Mr. Whittingham. That's super. It takes a, a lot of team members that have diverse backgrounds, but it takes a lot of support, too. Well, guys, we wish you the best of luck. We can't wait to see that 4,300 and counting uh, <laughs> flight coming up here soon. Uh, you know, UAH, thank you so much for joining us out here at NASA Student Launch. Uh, we can't, can't wait to see that your, your rocket fly. Thank you. That is the University of Alabama, Huntsville. Their rocket is out there on the rails uh, getting ready for its flight.
Hey everyone, I am joined now by Stephen Ellert uh, with the Chandra uh, Space Telescope. Now, now uh, tell us what Chandra is. So Chandra is a really cool telescope. It's an X-ray telescope. And X-ray telescopes help us really understand different parts of the sky than what you would see with a telescope you probably have at your house or your backyard or your school or some, some other place where you've seen a telescope. So the sky looks really different in X-rays than it does in sort of the light that we're nor normally used to seeing. And by looking at all these different kinds of lights, we're able to really understand better what's going on out in space. Now, when most people think space telescopes, they probably envision Hubble and its giant mirrors. But the setup for Chandra is a little different than that, isn't it? A little bit. So the mirrors look different. They're not, uh, they're not sort of shells of a, shells of a circle or they're not something you can look into very easily and see your own face in them. They're kind of these long barrels and because of the way x-rays are best reflected you get these long barrels and everything comes in practically straight on and skips off the surfaces of those mirrors like rocks on the water. Now tell us, talk to us about what your role well, with the Space Telescope is. So I work in the Project Science Office which basically means that I help sort of oversee what's going on with all the operations and some of the en some of the engineering, at least the engineering that I have to do now, but really help understand how the project and how all the operations sort of best serve the science community. Chandra's been up there for a number of years now. Have there been any surprise discoveries? Well, there have been a lot. Um, it's been up for 23 years and it's been doing really awesome science every year. Um, so what I'll say is there have been lots of surprises about sort of the population of black holes going all the way back to the earliest stages of the universe and lots of surprises with supernova remnants and my personal favorite which are galaxy clusters which are these giant amalgamations of hot gas and galaxies thousands of galaxies all orbiting around a single point that it's weighs as much as a million billion suns so now, now when we see those images and i know chandra is part of uh, one of uh, the many projects of marshall space flight centers portfolios and those pictures are absolutely stunning when we, uh, when we get them. They are. They're, they're really cool. You, with the x-rays what you're really seeing are like the fireworks, you know, the really big explosions and the really hot gas. It's kind of, uh, it's really where a lot of the really exciting action can be. Um, now just as you're seeing with these rockets fly, we're seeing the hot gas and we're seeing the flames come out of the back end. We're also studying them in the stars and the galaxies and, and things that uh, by far to go uh, beyond my comprehension, but I love to look at those pictures. Mm -hmm. um, now talk to us, so I'm going to pull in some rocketry. Talk to us about the importance of a launch vehicle uh, for the telescope. Well, it, the launch is a really important part. Of course, without the launch, you never make it up into space to begin with. Um, but what's really important about the launch is, you know, every spacecraft, including Chandra, every telescope, has an orbit, and that's part of how they plan the mission, how they plan the science of the mission. What can you do from this spot out in the space? Or what can you do from another spot out in space? So Chandra has a very specific orbit. It's very, very elliptical. It goes way above the Earth and it comes down. It's a, sort of its closest. It's still higher than like the International Space Station or something like that, but it's a lot closer. But it's designed that way in order to optimize certain science goals. And of course, you need a vehicle that can actually get it there and get it to those speeds and get it to those altitudes. So those launch vehicles are crucial. That's excellent. Now, we sure appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, why, why was it important for you to come out here and, and hang out with us at Student Launch? Well, this is the next generation of scientists and engineers who are going to make the next generation of missions. And there's always going to be new science to learn, and there's always going to be really cool science to learn, and it's going to be it's going to require a lot of hard thinking. And you need people who are ready to start doing that thinking now. So, well, that's so awesome. we need to encourage them. We sure appreciate you coming out here and spending a few minutes with us. I know uh, the next rockets, I'm looking out there, we've got a bunch of rockets on the rails, y'all. We're not far from these launches. Stephen, thank you so much for coming out and joining us out right. here at NASA State Pleasure Launch. to be here. Y'all, we do so much more at Marshall Space Flight Center than just propulsion. <laughs> I like the rocket, um, but we also do a lot of incredible science, and this is just one of the many examples of what we do and how it relates to what we're doing out here at Student Launch.
space is for everyone. We're all working towards a common goal. Just seeing people learn and grow and the community benefiting as, as a whole. We have vendors from all around this country and all of that's bringing in uh, a lot of jobs and getting to work in our community. I give back by seeing companies grow. My work means something. It, it provides people with the ability to feed their families. Not everyone who works on the space program is, is an engineer or a scientist in a white lab coat and there's vital roles Everybody at NASA is very teamwork driven. Nothing that we do here is done by itself. All successful missions come from a team that works together that is diverse. And we each bring a different perspective to the team to help us achieve our goals. There's literally an expert kind of within arm's reach that you can ask any question to and you'll probably get one of the best answers in the world. We take a lot of ownership in what we do. You get to see a lot of that passion. You get to see a lot of that drive. People want to do their best. People want to pull together to be a part of this program that's bigger than what any of us can accomplish on our own. NASA does the trailblazing with technology. The kind of work we do, you can't rest on your laurels and say, okay, we're there. There's no end to what we can achieve. So we have to keep pushing ourselves. And any airplane that I get on, it's exciting to think about, oh, this airplane probably at some point passed through many of our centers. We are with you when you fly. We, we are coming up with safer, newer technologies that are more silent, more energy efficient. Just to be able to work here and be able to design and touch something that will one day travel to a new planet is amazing. I mean, the, it's, it's indescribable. NASA brings hope and inspiration by leading the world to space for the progression of all people. Hi, we are here with Cedarville University of Cedarville, Ohio. Can you give me your name, major, and year in school? Hi, my name is Chad Sanderson, and I'm a senior mechanical engineering student at Cedarville University. Great, well, thanks for being here with us today. Chad, we hear it's your first time here with us. What has the process been like preparing for today? It's been a lot of work. Uh, we're a small team, so we've had to work a lot together, uh, learn a lot of team building skills, as well as uh, just learning how to do a lot of the documentation and some of the, uh, just the new requirements that NASA specifies. Um, we've had a lot of challenges along the way, but we're just very thankful uh, to have made it to this point, and we're just thankful for the Lord for that. Well, as a first year team, you know, you mentioned you had some challenges. There are a lot of bumps that come with a brand new experience. So can you tell us kind of what you've overcome to get to this point today? So our second full scale rocket launch ended uh, catastrophically, ended uh, catastrophically. So we lost about 90% of our vehicle. And so we had to rebuild our rocket in under two weeks and fly uh, to make it here. And um, honestly, that was one of the hardest challenges we ever faced. Um, had to 
do a lot of uh, late nights and just work really hard as a team and just the the perseverance that went into getting here and even the way that we found um, the the issue with our recovery system that we fixed uh, I really believe like God really wanted us here as a team and that's just been like a really cool thing for us way to push through congratulations for making it here today mm -hmm. and what advice would you give to an up-and-coming team so I would say for for new teams definitely just stick through it when the report writing and the other sections are hard um, stay together as a team and don't uh, don't use your energy against each other use it to um, to continue to build each other up um, to sharpen one another and to encourage each other as you're going uh, especially just as um, the timelines are very tight and so just make sure you're planning and that um, just that you're keeping um, good interaction between the team. Well you guys have overcome a lot to get here today. What do you think you are most proud of working through all of those challenges? What's your most proud moment of this experience so far? I think uh, the most proud moment was one of our team members, uh, Jacob Titus, made an air brake system uh, as, as a single individual and he put so much work into it. Um, after our catastrophic failure, it sadly got destroyed and we couldn't rebuild it. But that was one of the coolest things we did this year uh, as a team just working on the rocket. And um, we're hoping that maybe that experience can be used for our future teams as well. And we already have a team for next year planning to come. We know it takes a whole team to get here. Who else would you like to thank? Maybe a professor, a teacher for helping you get here today? Um, I'd definitely like to thank uh, our advisors, Dr. Ward, Dr. Toonstra, who spent a lot of time helping us through this project. Um, our parents, our family members, our friends that have supported us through the project, that have made it possible, that have encouraged us and helped us to be here. Um, my team members, because I'm just a face for the team, but I'm not the team. Um, just they are the ones who are putting in a lot of work as well. And just very thankful for the work that they contributed. And lastly, um, I'm just very thankful for how God made this possible. Uh, we're from Cedarville University, which is a private Christian uh, university. And um, even on the back of our shirts, it says, for the, word of, uh, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we really just want to share what we care about as a team and the fact that you know, Jesus came and saved us from our sins and that that is extended to anyone who chooses to believe and accept him. And uh, we're just hoping that that could be extended to everyone and as well as just that the hope and the life that gives to all believers and even to us as a team. Well, this is Cedar University joining us today. Thank you guys so much for coming and best of luck today. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
two, one, you're hot. So we're back here at uh, Student Launch uh, 2022 on a windy, windy day. Uh, we're here with Gerald Mukes, and uh, you're the guy that pushes the buttons, are you not? I'm a part of the team that does push the buttons, <laughs> yes. So the part that I get to do and really enjoy is to be able to, to talk about the projects that's going up, what we call a launch control officer from, from a hobby perspective. Okay. And what that role of the launch control officer is to make sure that we're connecting the rocket with the team, with the crowd, so everybody knows what's going on, so everyone's engaged. We always make sure safety is the utmost importance to what's happening with the event. Um, but then one of those functions does include pushing the button, but I'm able to actually pass that off to have someone else be able to push the button so I can really focus in on talking about the projects. Because these are some really incredible projects that are out there yeah. in some of the types of payloads in experiments they're testing out, which is really great and rewarding for, for me to see as a, as a high power rocketry enthusiast. Yeah. Now I've been listening to some of the conversations you've been having with some of the teams as they've been coming forward. You've been asking a lot of questions about, you know, you know, some, tell me something special, what, 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 you know, what your team has got going on, or tell me something, you know, what's the superstition that you guys have, or, you know, what's something special about your rocket, something about the paint job, or I mean, you're asking all kinds of questions. It's not just about the science of, of, uh, of, of the launch itself, but you're asking all kinds of like, you know, so, sort of like, uh, what, what, what makes it personal to, to each team? And I think, that's, I think that's really great. What are some of the cool things that you've heard, uh, you've heard thus far? I, I think what's really fun about hearing some of the stories is just what perseverance these teams have had to go through to get where they're at here today. Mm -hmm. Just hearing, okay, the rocket didn't work as well, so we've had to rebuild it a couple different times, but it, we feel confident to where we're at. We're testing out some new things. The paint's drying in route here, <laughs> using some really large quick links, stuff that I've never seen. I saw a, a thimble being used as part of the ejection, <laughs> okay, all right. uh, ejection charge. So that part's really neat because that gives me some of those ideas because sometimes we like it set in the ways of how we think a high power hobby rocket should go. Right. And it's like, no, this is what's great about this event is it definitely helps out NASA and our, and our rocketry community, but also helps us out on a, on a hobby front as well. Nice. And uh, what, uh, do you have any, any, uh, any words of wisdom about uh, what we're, how we're dealing with the wind today out here? Yeah, so that's, that's a good thing. So one of the things I'm doing as LCO is making sure I'm kind of checking, doing as LCO is making sure I'm kind of checking for the sky, checking for the range, and then we do the audible countdown to launch. Well, part of that is checking sky, looking at the weather, and looking at the wind conditions. So when the wind's kind of coming from the south, kind of blowing towards the crowd, we actually angle the pads to try to have the rockets kind of divert around it. Okay. Now, with the wind being a headwind to us, the rockets actually want to turn turn like into the wind, and that's when the rocket comes out under parachutes when it's drifting down. So one of the things that I'm doing as a launch control officer is telling the crowd, look up, point at the rocket, let your neighbor know, so we're making sure we're keeping safety of the utmost importance. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so uh, since you're the guy that's doing the countdowns and calling the shots today, we probably ought to let you get back to it. Yeah, time to, time to go punch back in and get yeah. back to work. How many rockets do we have coming up? I think we're at like seven or eight, I think, for this group. So there's there's a good amount of group okay. going. So it'll be fun to, to resume some rocket flying. I think that's why we're all here and hear some of the stories. Now put the two pieces together and Excellent. let's go. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you. Good deal.
Now, if you're being a little overstable, it probably might be a little shy of that because it was turning into the wind. There's an event. And this does house the Jolly Logic, and it should release at 700 feet. Motor was a K535. See a little bit of the reflection from that white. Nice paint job on that one. And the main is set for 700 feet. Still probably over 1,000 feet. I'm not as good as Art, so I'm not going to be able to guess that 700 foot on the mark. We're getting closer, though, so we should be at 700 feet right there. Yes, that is an awesome flight. Nice job, team. I feel like saluting that rocket. That's just uh, really cool. Nice work. Okay, we're going to the next rocket. So just to the right of that one that just, uh, and that rocket touched down, so they're all satisfied. Pad number 33, so one that's to the right of the one that just took off. This is Granada Hills Rocketry Group. They are called AYSO Region 174 in Granada Hills, Southern California. The name of this rocket is C Cygnus. It weighs 9.8 pounds, three inch in diameter, 7.3 feet tall. The payload's purpose is to determine the stability of potato life by, me by measuring the lux, CO2, concentration, temperature, and humidity at different altitudes and ranking them by their proximity to the potato optimal conditions as a proof of concept. I like all these food forward projects combined with rocketry, so we're going to go in the right direction. This motor is flying on a Cesaroni J380. The projected altitude is 4,700 feet, so you can see that's the yellow rocket. It's uh, painted to follow the, their theme colors for their, their club name. And this, I like to call it the biology project. This rocket should be going about 4,700 feet. So we still have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We're going to launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Hope they're not mashed potatoes. Starting to arc over. That might be closer to 4,700 feet. Okay, we should have an event. There it is. Yeah. Not yeah. sure of the status of this potato. Hopefully it's okay. I know it's testing and measuring all the different aspects of it. The CO2 concentration, temperature, humidity, and it's doing it at different iterations at the altitude. So when it hits a milestone, it's, it's looking for information. So pretty cool that the school's trying this out. And this is one of our SLI competing teams. So it still looks like it's probably two, over 2,000 feet up there, small drogue parachute. Still coming in at a good descent race. Yeah, it's out, it's out past by the tree line on the... So you see, if you look at it, point at it, let your neighbors know, but it's over way out in the grass, so we're good. We should have a main here pretty soon. There it is. All right. That potato's looking good. Maybe it's going to be a baked potato. All right. I was told we should not joke about the fries. I'm sorry. Okay, um, if you actually just want to put this down right on there, then I can see. There you go. Perfect. Okay, we're going to pad number 34. We have Lipscomb Rocketry. This is Lipscomb University from Nashville, Tennessee, on pad number 34. So it's the blue and white, ro or blue rocket with the white nose cone. The name of this rocket is New Gwyn. Weighs 21 and a half pounds. Looks like that says four inch in diameter. Seven feet tall. This does have a dead reckoning system and takes acceleration and gyroscopic data to calculate 
position of rocketry upon landing. The motor on this is an Aerotech K1275 uh, red line, so it's going to have a red flame on it. Main is set for 600 feet. So this rocket does also have a 3D printed nose cone. And I, one thing I did find out, this nose cone shape is inspired by airlines. So it's not a normal nose cone shape to it. So pretty cool on that one. And oh, another fun fact about Lipscomb University. This one, it, this university is 131 years old. So pretty cool on that as well. Okay, we're gonna fly this on pad 34. We have a clear sky, have a clear range. We're gonna launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Ooh, needs a new igniter on that one. Burnt the igniter. So we'll have to wait on that one. So now we're gonna go to the far back pads. Okay, we just have to do a quick test to make sure that you have the bank on. It was just a couple of uh, technical difficulties. Usually to get these things to work, you gotta plug them in. So I, I own that one, forgot to plug it into the socket. No, we're going back to the 40s. Yeah, we're going to 40s. Yeah, we're gonna be going back to the far back pads. We're gonna go to pad 40. As you can see, yeah, we're going to pad number 40. The name of this group is a UMass Rocket Team. This is the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. The name of this rocket is Argo. We'll come back to that name, Argo. 24 pounds, four inch in diameter, eight and a half feet tall. This does have some sort of proprietary thing called the Athena. It's an inertial navigation system utilizing two B&O accelerometer, gyroscope packages, computers displacement management, custom PCB design with an exclamation point. They are proud for that. That is awesome. One thing I found out about this group, the group painted that rocket right before they headed here to Alabama, so it was drying in transit trying to get here. That name, this rocket is called Argo. It is a take on Jason and the Argonauts, but this rocket has been built several times, so they really think the name of the rocket should be called Chip of the Cianus. Theseus. I'm not quite sure that's a reference to something I'm not quite familiar with. Also, they have their inspiration on this project is making sure that they have visor glasses and something around Team Cyclone. Again, not sure what these references are. This rocket should go about 5,600 feet. So we are going to go to pad 40. So we have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We're going to launch UMass Rocket Team in five, 
four, three, two, one, ignition. So that was definitely a red line, possibly a K1275, but it could be a Cesaroni. It's a mystery motor, at least on the, my briefing sheet. The main is set for 600 feet. There is an event. The paint's now probably dry. And that's pretty far out southbound. So again, when that rocket took off because of the headwind and the and it rocket being overstable, the rocket actually turned into the wind. And then when it's coming in under parachute, the wind's kind of bringing it back. That's why these rockets have dual deployment on it. That small parachute has it come down pretty quick and then at a spe specified altitude based on how they've programmed their flight computer, a bigger parachute comes out to make sure it's a nice, soft, safe landing for their payload package. We're getting pretty close to that 600 feet, eh, maybe over 1,000 here still. Mm, probably just under 1,000 feet, right here. Okay, we should be approaching 600 feet now. There it is. All right. I guess we can go back to calling it the Argo rocket. That's looking pretty nice. Good flight, team. Okay, I like the nice golf clap, pretty cool. Okay, we're going to pad 41 Cat Rocketry. The school is Central Washington University out of Ellingsburg, Washington. The name of this rocket is called Newbie. So I found out the name on Newbie. This is their first time here competing. So welcome team and glad you're here and trying out this competition. This rocket does weigh 24 and 3 quarters pounds just over five inch in diameter, and the length is eight and three quarters feet. It is flying on a K-1050, so it's a pretty healthy motor on that. The experimentation, this is again one of those another proprietary systems, this one's called Avatar. They're saying we are using a visual tracking using color on top of our tent, oh okay, this is cool, in order to identify and report the landing location. And with Central Washington University, it's literally in the center of the state of Washington. They are known for a rodeo in this uh, central, wa in Ellensburg, Washington. Another thing with this group, they literally built this rocket out of a closet. So pretty cool that they're just trying to be efficient with their resources. And it is a pretty mighty team of nine members. So pretty cool that they built this cool yellow rocket with the black stripes on it. And this projected altitude is 4,158 feet. So let's see if our eyes are good enough to see if it's got 4,158 for altitude. On pad 41, we have the clear skies. We have a clear range. We're going to launch Newbie in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Come on, Man, that's straight up. Okay, do we think that's 4,158 feet? My assist tells me 4152. Starting to arc over. There's an event. I see the smoke blowing over. There's a parachute. That bright yellow or bright orange chute so we can see it. It's got a really long shot cord on that from what I can see, which is good. That's a good thing to have. That's either a really big drogue or the main could be out a little on the early side. Just a, just a big drogue. 36 inch drogue, and this main parachute is set for 550 feet. That's the only way this avatar system can work the most efficiently. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds good. Okay, heads up on the right side of the range so it looks like it's going to be out in the on the out in the grass or out in the wheat there's 500 feet uh oh the parachute's uh, thinking about it uh, that's going to be out in the wheat it's not 
Oh, it's trying. It's very suspenseful, like a Hollywood film, and it's down. Hey, but Wildcat Rocketry is okay with that. Good flight. So we're still on the back row. We still got rockets to fly. So we're on pad number 42. This is Cedarville Student Launch. They are at Cedar. Oh, they're already pumped. Yeah, it didn't take off yet. All right, let's go. Okay, this is Cedarville University out of Cedarville, Ohio. The name of this rocket is Forerunner. Weighs 42.3 pounds, five and a half inch diameter. It's nine feet long. Does have a single bay on it and is dual deploy. This, this uh, rocket's flying on an L motor. This is flying on an L1390 green motor. So it'll have a green flame on it. The main is set for 800 feet. So the experiment of this project does have another proprietary system called the Gamma Filtering System, GFS. It observes the rocket's position using IMUs and integrates to find position using some sort of co coordination system. So Cedarville did want to thank their family and friends for helping them on this project. And this is a team that was of 11 and 12 team members. And again, this is their first time out. So welcome, Cedarville University. Glad you're here. And this is their second full-scale rocket. Don't ask about what happened to their first one. Maybe later. This altitude should be going about 4,750 feet. So we are ready to go on pad 42. We have a clear sky, we have a clear range. We're gonna launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. So that was an L motor, L green motor. Starting to arc over, so maybe I, that's probably all of 4,700 feet. Might be higher. There is an event. Be higher. There is an event. I saw a backup. There's the drogue out. Still see. So some of that smoke you're seeing, that's the tracking smoke from the motor. So there's a tracking element put inside the motor, so it's easy to visually spot coming in, which aids in the recovery part of it. So the main is set for 800 feet. I think the team's kind of biting their nails a little bit. There should be a little bit more confidence over there. I can hear them a little bit. So we're probably passing around 2,000 feet right now. Still out in the wheat. We should be about 1,000 feet right now, so we should be approaching 800 feet. Oh, I saw the event. I didn't see a parachute come out. Backup's supposed to, oh, oh this one's going to come in. I hope the wheat can brace it. Oh. We saw the event, but didn't see the nose cone separate from the payload tube. A little bit of more of a somber clap on that one. We'll have to do an analysis after just to make sure it's okay. All right, we're, we're continuing on, so we're going to... Pad number 43, this is JMU Rocketry, James Madison University. Oh, they're pretty excited, out of Harris, Harrisonburg, Virginia. The name of this rocket is Zeus-1. This, this is a hefty rocket. This one weighs 53 pounds, six inch in diameter. It was originally nine feet, 11 inches tall, and somehow has grown now to 10 feet tall. Don't know what happened there. Oh, it's a teenager, I've been told. Okay, this is flying on an Aerotech L1420 Redline, so another L motor. Does have the main set for 700 feet. With this project, it does have a dead reckoning system on it and two IMUs with an Arduino to go with. This altitude should be going about 4,000 feet, and it does have a camera on board, so make sure you show that nice smiling face for everyone in the crowd. So we're going to go to pad 43. We have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We're going to launch Zeus 1 in 5, 
four, three, two, one, ignition. Burnt the igniter. We pushed pretty hard. No go. So I have to put a new igniter in that one. Okay, on pad number 44, we have Purdue University PSP-LL. This school's Purdue University out of West Lafayette, Indiana. Is the saying boiler down, boiler, broiler? Oh, okay, I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm getting some uh, scour looks right now. I know it's boiler up. So the name of this rocket is Green Grass All Green gas all breaks. Need some better penmanship. So this is 53.4 pounds. This is six inch in diameter, 106 inches tall. So another 50 pound rocket. This one's flying on a L2200, which I believe is an Aerotech green. So this is gonna be a pretty punchy takeoff. The experimentation on board with this one, it does say separating, orienti orienting, and, ex and extending a tri- Lateration radio range finding experiment. That is a mouthful. But there's a lot going on. That's pretty cool to have that project. The main is set for 800 feet. So a couple things about Purdue University's team. The overall PSP team has over 400 members a part of this group. And there's seven different teams within this group as a part of the club on campus. I also noticed they have a, a really large ground control station. I think it's bigger than some panel boxes at some houses that I've seen. On this team alone, they have 60 to 80 members on this team. They did say on this rocket, the lower airframe did have to be rebuilt and reflown on one of the last flights. The motor did some extra burning in places they didn't like, so they had to rebuild the bottom half of it. The projected altitude is somewhere between 4,600 and 5,400 feet. So the air braking system, we'll find out if it's going to work. So we'll see, 4,600 or 5,400 feet. Okay, I've been notified of a plane inbound, and yes, thank you for that. So right now we hold all launch operations. We don't want to spook our pilots, so we want them, if they're flying, to fly where they have to fly, and then we can resume flying. Even though they're flying probably outside of where our operations are, if we can visually see them, they could probably see us. We don't want them to see our rocket. So we're going to make sure it is clear, it's outbound, it's safe. So, no, thank you. So if anyone sees a plane, I see some waving it off. I don't know if they can see that, but uh, I like the effort. We're trying to guide that plane out of our, our operation area. Okay, plane is outbound, so we're going to go and fly the PSP-SL rocket on pad 44. We have a clear sky. That plane's out. Clear range. No one's nearby. We're going to launch this one in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Burnt the igniter on that one. Those green ones can be a little tricky, so new igniter on that one. We have another launch right now. The sky was a little bit off. Is it coming inbound or is it going? Is that the same air? It's really low in altitude. It's really low. It's I, I mean, it's out of our visual. It's like really low one. I'll start reading the card, but I don't see it. Okay, we're going to continue on on pad number 45. So it's the black rocket with the blue nose cones, the one in the center of the, well, I guess left of center. The name of this rocket is called, or team name is called, Charger Rocket Works. It's the 
All right. I love the excitement. This is Alabama Huntsville out of Huntsville, Alabama. They probably had to travel really far to get here. The name of this rocket is Cloud Killer. 27 pound rocket weighs, or yeah, 27 pounds. It's four and a half inch diameter, just over seven and a quarter feet long. The apogee is set for the, it's supposed to go 4,600 feet. This does have an INS with an IMU and does have a correcting, I'm not sure what it says, static system. We'll figure that one out. It does have a stratologer on board. And I found out with this rocket in particular, it's got a really cool, I'll say, rocker-themed paint job to it. And I think the rocket's just excessively driven around across the country because when they wanted to fly it, they, had, they were missing some parts. So it's got a lot of road miles on it. Needs a little bit more air miles. Got it backwards. Okay, so we're going to try to fly this rocket. I don't see that airplane, so we have a clear sky on pad 45, clear range. We're going to launch the cloud killer. There's no clouds in the sky. In five, four, three, two, one, ignition. On the Aerotech K-1000. We burned another igniter. Well, no, we burned another igniter. We were having continuity, and we push the button, and we lose continuity. So the first few work, so I just think we need a little bit more, another igniter. We'll try the... We'll, Okay, continuing on, we're going to hope this igniter is good. So this is pad 60. This is UNCC 49er rocketry team. And this is the school UNC Charlotte out of Charlotte, North Carolina. The name of this rocket is Draco. 42 pounds, 5 inch in diameter, just over 8 feet tall. The fun fact on this one, its thrust to weight ratio is 7.4. So that's going to have a pretty good takeoff. This one is also flying on an L- 1390 green main is set for 600 feet this one has the anvil system i don't know what that is but the anvil is a gimbaled camera that is used to capture images throughout descent and image processing is used to find landing location i do know what the name of this rocket they called it draco it's based on the dragon constellation which i think is pretty pretty neat and it does have a, you see a spiral up up the paint job. That's actually a dragon painted on the side of it. It does use a camera-based approach and computer vision system where the camera does retract in and out of the airframe tube under recovery. It has a lot of 3D printed parts, 3D printed nose cone, boat tail, and 3D printed internal fins that are removable. I also thought was really cool with UNCC, their mentor actually competed in this USLI competition back in 2013. So welcome back. Thanks for helping this team out. This rocket, oh, there we yeah, thank you. And this rocket should go about 5,000 feet. So we're hoping this igniter is good on pad 60 on the L motor. We're going to fly it. We have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We are going to launch Draco in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. So the this is also now showing it's it burned the igniter and showing it's open. It's another green motor. Those can be tricky to light. We only have one more rocket to try, so let's see if this one gives us some good luck. Okay, we're going to try out pad 62, farthest to the right on the far back pads. This team name is Swamp Launch. They're University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. The rocket name is Alberta, weighs 24.24 pounds, 4 inches in diameter, 9 and a quarter feet long. It's a fiberglass airframe. 
all the test flights were successful on its first attempts. <clears throat> this is flying on an Aerotech L1090 White. Does have electronics on board. The main is set for 600 feet with a backup at 550. The title of this science experiment is called Landmark Watney. It has two cameras aft taking photos on ascent to determine its initial point on map, and then the IMU data is used to track displacement of final landing location. That is really cool. I also know with this group, I was calling it the Gator Locator, but they said don't have any reference to the Seminoles. I don't know what that means, but they said focus on the Gators. I said I can do that. So on pad 62, we are gonna launch Alberta. We have a clear sky, clear range. Hope this igniter is good. We're gonna launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Got a bunch of bad igniters out there. Starting to arc over, I would say that's 5,000 feet. There's an event, see that orange parachute? So that rocket does have the drogue out. So we're still we're still a couple thousand feet up right now under its drogue. Got that bright orange drogue parachute. So hopefully the cameras looking down helped it for its initial launch location, and then the IMUs are supposed to go to work to determine its final landing location. We're below a thousand feet. Should be the mains coming out at 600 feet, which should be pretty close. Probably about now would be good. There's an event. There's the backup. Alberta team is happy. That's good. Now the cameras are pointing back down, and the IMUs are doing its job, hopefully, and it's going to tell us where it's at. Way out in the wheat, and it is down. I see them even cheering. They even brought some pom-poms. That's pretty cool. Okay, so the range is open for putting new igniters for these rockets that are out here right now. Team lead for Alabama Huntsville to the LCO desk or table or tent. Team lead for University of Alabama Huntsville to the LCO desk.
So uh, announcement for the student launch mentors. If you're looking for a stipend check, you're going to want to go to the student launch tent. So as you're trying to walk up to the LCL, you're going to catch the student launch tent. And that's where you will go to pick up your stipend checks. So just a quick announcement on that. Also, maybe a pro tip, as you've seen some of these rockets didn't go, dual igniters could be your friend. Just be careful. Don't put too big of igniters, but you want to make sure you've got an igniter in there that's going to launch the rocket. And we'll be resuming some flying here in just uh, momentarily. and 2020.
Lipscomb University. Okay, yep, and this group is out of Nashville, Tennessee. The name of this rocket is New Gwyn. 21 and a half pounds, four inch in diameter, seven feet tall. This has the dead reckoning system that takes acceleration and gyroscopic data to calculate positioning of rocket upon landing. This has the Aerotech K1275. The main is set for 600 feet. The one last thing I just wanted to check. So we're not sure how high exactly this one will go, but it does have the 3D printed nose cone that's got a take on, on a commercial airliner shape. Pad 34, we have a clear sky, we have a clear range. We're gonna launch new Gwyn in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Well, if you're starting to doze off, I think that motor might have woke you up. Starting to arc over probably 4,500 feet. We want to parachute probably pretty soon. Yep, there is an event. Okay, there is something out. Must be a very small drogue. The main is set for 600 feet. That's a really small drogue. I had it, and then it, I think the ref I lost the reflection. Oh, I see it, yep. So I, I do see it. It's got a small drogue on it. It's pretty much straight out in front of me at the LCO desk. So normally the rockets were more towards the west side. This one is more just straight south of us. Main is set for 600 feet. We're below 1,000 feet right now. We should be, yep, there's 600. There's its, uh, so group on this one, you can see the wind is blowing this right back to us at the LCO desk. We're just going to make sure this one is nice, down, and safe. Unless it's trying to be closest to the pad, maybe. That's what it looks like it's trying to do. Maybe when it says, where did it land? Maybe where it took off. This is Lipscomb University. Yeah. 
It's a very nice slow descent on this one. But you can see that wind now has blown it back on the west side. Just over into the wheat. It was like a good textbook flight. Nice job, team. Okay, we're going to the far back pads now. We're going to pad 43. We have JMU, James Madison University out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. This is Zeus 1. This is the heavy one. 53-pound rocket, 6-inch in diameter. This is the one that was originally 9 feet 11 inches, grew to 10 feet. It does have an Aerotech L motor, L1420 red line. Main is set for 700 feet. Has the dead reckoning system with two IMUs and an Arduino. Should go 4,900 feet. Has the camera on board, so make sure everyone is smiling. Pad 43, we have the clear sky. We have the clear range. We're going to launch this one in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. There we go. That definitely did not go 4,900 feet. So starting arc over, I'd say maybe 2,500, 3,000 feet. We won an event here pretty soon. There's the, there it is, there's its backup, there's an event. They are very excited, a little bit of a delay there, but they're excited. So what happened on that one, probably very overstable and it turned into the wind which probably hindered its 4,900 feet altitude. But as long as they know where it's located, I think it's the more important part to it. They do have their main set for 700 feet. We're probably coming in about 1,500 feet right now. This one's over a little on the east side of us where we're at the LCO desk. We should be approaching below 1,000 feet. We should be about 700 feet right about now is where we should see that. Okay, I was a little off, sorry. There's the main. It's looking good. Furthest east from the pad, that's for sure. But looks like a really good flight there. Way out there. And it looks like it landed right on the pivot. So it's now turned into an agricultural project. Okay, we're going to pad number 44. Uh, this is Purdue University PSPSL out of West Lafayette, Indiana. This is the green gas all brakes. I got it right this time. Another very lightweight rocket coming in at 53 pounds, 6 inch in diameter, 106 inches tall. This does have the Aerotech L2200 green motor, so it's going to take off with a little bit of oomph does have the main set for 800 feet. This has the separating, orienti orienting, and extending trilateration radio range finding experiment, the mouthful of the project here. I know this is the new bottom half on this rocket, and this is the, the team that seems to run pretty deep, I think. Okay, pad 44, we're going to launch this rocket. We have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We're going to launch in five, four, three. Two, one, ignition. Wow. Like hearing that nice echo off that motor. I think I heard someone say super loud. I would agree. Super loud indeed. Starting to arc over. We need a parachute here pretty soon. There's an event. Looks like a project that was trying to head towards the sun. I don't know if it's going to quite make it there, but I do see the drogue parachute out. This main is set for 800 feet. We're still probably 3,000 feet right now. And because of the requirements of this competition, should be a pretty good sized main parachute because of the weight that this rocket carries. We're below a thousand feet right now. We should see that main parachute come right now. There it is, now it's open, there's its backup charge. They are very excited. 
Right. It looks like they even have the colors corresponding to their university. Nice touch. Give their head of marketing kudos. So now as you can see, this rocket, this rocket is coming back to us at the LCO desk. So it is under parachute. Look at this rocket, point at it, let your neighbors know. Don't touch it, don't catch it. Heads up folks, right here by the LCO. Heads up everyone, point at it, look at it, let your neighbors know, it should be out in the wheat. Why does Purdue always have to have it so exciting? We don't need that kind of excitement out here. They wanted to be near the social media tent. They got their moment on Facebook, okay? Good flight. Okay, we're gonna continue on. Pad number 45. This is Charger Rocket Works. This is Alabama Huntsville out of Huntsville, Alabama. They had to travel far for it is Cloud Killer. 27 pounds, four and a half inch in diameter, just over seven feet tall. This one should be going 4,600 feet on an Aerotech K1000. Main is set for 600 feet. This does have an INS with an IMU, internal navigation system, an internal measuring unit. Has a correcting static system. It does have a strata logger, and this is the one that's been driven around a bunch around the country. And it's got the, I'll say, rocker-themed paint job, which was pretty neat to see. Pad 45, we have the thumbs up, so we have the clear sky. We have a clear range. We're going to launch the cloud killer in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. I was told this one is the sun hunter, not the cloud killer. Might need to change the name. Let me talk to your marketing department. So it should be at 4,600 feet, maybe. There's an event. There's the backup to that one. I don't see it yet. Sounds like one person on the team's excited. Okay, that sounds a little better. Yep, there it is. I see it under a pretty small drogue. It's over to the east side or the left side of the LCO desk, or kind of 180 from north, I'll say. I think I got my directions right. The main on this one is set for 600 feet. So we're below 1,000 feet. We should see the main here pretty soon at 600. We're below 700. We should see the main right now. There it is. All right. They're trying to land near their, I think, agricultural grass. I think their, their land is just right over there. But now the wind's taking it back over this way. And that looks like it's going to be on track for a nice good landing. Hopefully no, it's location of where it landed. And it's down. Good flight. Okay, we're going to the last, last rocket on this bank on Pad number 60, we have UNCC 49er rocketry team. UNC Charlotte out of Charlotte, North Carolina. This rock is called Draco, 42 pounds, 5 inch in diameter, just over 8 feet tall. This thrust to weight is 7.4, so you'll get to see what that looks like. Flying on an L1390 green, so green flame on this one, main set for 600 feet. This has the anvil system, which is a gimbal camera that is used to capture images throughout descent and image processing that is used to find landing location. This is the one at Apogee. It'll actually drop down a camera and start its imaging, imaging scanning process and then go back up and retract into the rocket. So there's a lot going on with this one. And you see the twisted paint job. That's actually with the dragon or the Draco look to it. So the, in the dragon constellation is the name of it. On pad 60, clear sky, got the thumbs up, clear range. We will launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Nice little echo on that one. That one went pretty straight up on there. I wasn't sure what the projected altitude or predicted altitude is, but it looks to be over 4,000. We need an event. There's an event. There's its backup. 
maybe a third one on there possibly. And I don't know if these are in two and I don't know if these are in two different pieces or one piece. Two pieces. Okay, so they need extra team members to track all these pieces coming in, but this is where the part of the project starts retracting down a camera. And then there's a parachute that came out. I don't know if it's supposed to come out that early, but it did. And then there is a and then second piece does have its own recovery system. So the first piece looks like it's had its main out. I don't know if the main was supposed to come out that high, but it is. So there it goes. And then the other part, oh, it should be there's it, there's its event. Okay, there's the all is all the stuff is out. One of the parachutes looks to be out pretty high up. That's going to be doing a uh, we'll be up there for quite a while. With the way with the wind that will be out in the wheat, well behind the crowd. But what you can see here, the rocket's not moving a whole lot up in the air, so the surface winds are a little bit higher than the winds aloft. As it starts to come lower and lower, we'll see the rocket start to move a little bit quicker under that big, big main parachute. And you can see the lower part as it's starting to cruise down on the end of the wheat by the tree line. And that's down. And then the other part of the Draco rocket is still kind of cruising up there. OK, right now a range is open. So the part we're looking at now, this is the part I think that is doing their gimbaled camera that's capturing images throughout the descent and is doing the image processing. So the camera comes in and out. So it's scanning the field right now, taking pictures, and then before landing, it might go back up inside. So that is all the brains to the project. Just wanted to, I guess, see more of, take more pictures maybe. That's why the main came out a little early. Taking a scenic route is what I've been told. Taking a, a little more of a scenic route. But it's looking good, and it's well north of all of us, so we are okay. Range is open. Hello everyone, we are back with you. As you just saw, the first volley of launches uh, all took to the sky. Teams are out recovering their rockets, checking out how their payloads went right now. We are now joined by someone who knows just a little bit about rockets, uh, Mr. Dave Reynolds with NASA's Space Launch System program. Uh, Dave, tell us what your role is with SLS and what that Space Launch System rocket is. Yeah, thanks Will. Yeah, it's really exciting to be out here today. And, and uh, like you said, this is really, fairly similar in many ways to the to what I do as a living um, like like you said I work in the uh, SLS booster project office and 
uh, as, as most people probably know, the boosters are those two large white rockets that sit on either side of the SLS. And those are known as solid rockets as opposed to liquid rockets. Well, every one of these rockets that you're seeing today are all solid rockets. And so they're kind of cousins, kind of nephews to, to what we're planning on launching with the SLS program. And so that is the primary thing that we're working on, trying to get the, uh, the SLS up to, up to space. Um, and just as a brief status on where we're going, um, we've, we've recently rolled out to the pad. We're in a series of tests with, uh, with the SLS rocket. We've had three what we call wet dress rehearsal attempts. Um, each one of those, we're trying to learn different things about how to fill up the rocket with propellants, uh, do the countdown, run the software, and learn all sorts of things. So as you saw a little bit earlier with some of these rockets, you know, they had a couple of, of uh, problems trying to get some of them off the, off the pad. We have the exact same type of problems, just on a bigger scale. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do down at uh, Cape Canaveral right now, trying to learn more about our rocket, trying to figure out how we're going to get it off the ground, trying to figure out how we're going to get it up into space. So Dave, when we do launch that, what, uh, what is the destination, what is the goal of SLS and the Artemis program? Yeah, so ultimately, SLS is what we call a heavy lift vehicle, which means that it has a broad versatility that it can do. Um, the short term, what Artemis is trying to accomplish is to land the first uh, woman and first uh, person of color and, and uh, other astronauts on the moon again to not just visit like we did back in the 60s and 70s, but also uh, to uh, create a permanent presence. And so SLS enables that by having a heavy lift capability because as you know, it's all about, rockets are all about getting mass from the ground up into the sky, right? And so SLS needs to be able to carry a heavy payload to be able to get it from here on the Earth where it's built up into lunar orbit and then down to lunar orbit, down onto the surface of the, of the moon so that people can, uh, can ultimately learn to live and explore on the surface of the moon. And then down the road, we're going to try to enable deeper space missions. Uh, the next major step, obviously, for, for uh, humankind is uh, landing on the surface of Mars and starting to learn about other planets as opposed to just our next, uh, next door neighbor. So now we're looking at the Artemis generations, what we have out here today. How do the lessons that they've gone through, and, and they've gone through the uh, proposal process, they've gone through preliminary design review, critical design review, flight readiness reviews, how does what they're doing out here today and what they're learning relate to what we're doing and what lessons are they learning out here that will help them for a career in the space flight industry? Yeah, actually the process that you just described is a standard systems engineering process that we use right here at NASA. You start out with a, with a conceptual design and you go through the requirements. What are we trying to do? We're trying to loft, in this case, a payload up to approximately one mile. It's got to uh, pop a, a chute at about 700, 1,000 feet. And so you start to write these requirements down and then you come up with a preliminary design and then that basically gives you the architecture for your rocket and then you come up with a, with a, 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 certifica a certification design where you build and you test your rocket on the ground and you make sure that it's ready to go. And so if these students eventually come to work for NASA or any of the major aerospace rocket companies, they will go through that exa exact same type process. They'll just be doing it on a, on a bigger scale. So they are learning, uh, they are learning skills that are going to take them right into these aerospace careers and they'll be able to come into these meetings and say, yeah, we did that on our rocket. We solved problems like this. And uh, I mean, that's really what, what engineering and STEM is all about is solving the problems. And so it's just a, a standardized process and they're going to be very familiar with that process once they get into their careers. Yeah, excellent. I know we've talked to a lot of teams and we've got, we'll hear from more teams today about, about how their rockets went and some of the problems that, that they've encountered throughout this long process. Um, so you've seen the rockets fly. What was it like standing here, uh, real close to the flight line, watching those rockets take off for you? It's a lot of it's a lot of fun to watch these things because I mean I remember as a kid um, launching these small Estes rockets. You can go to the store and purchase these little uh, rocket motors and, and put them in these little rockets and launch them, and then you can get them bigger and bigger. And eventually, you got to get a, a certification to be able to buy some of the motors. Well, the one, rockets that these guys are flying, you got to have a certification. You got to have a membership of the club and and have uh, training and such to be able to launch these things. And so it's really exciting. I never made it that far, right? Yeah. I kind of went from the Estes motors 
all the way into the space launch <laughs> system, right? And so I think it would have, if I had gone back to college and I had a team like this, I would have joined it for sure because it would have been a tremendous experience to be able to launch these things, learn all about the engineering skills that it, uh, that that take place in building this thing and solving all the problems that get there. So it's, it's a lot of fun to be out here. So one of the things I want to ask you, um, talking about going to the big rockets, you've been up close with the Artemis 1 launch vehicle. We're targeting launch supply later this year. What is it like? I was there at rollout, so I was a few hundred yards away, and I felt like I could reach out and touch. What is it like working with that hardware and being up close with a rocket of that magnitude? Yeah, I'll tell you, it is it is bigger than you could possibly imagine. I mean, you see it you see it next to things, and it's going to give you some perspective of size. But and I used to work on the space shuttle, and the space shuttle was bigger than you could have possibly imagined. You stand at the foot of that thing, and you, and you're looking up at it, and you're saying, "Wow, I cannot believe that all of this goes up into space." But when I'm standing next to the SLS rocket, and it's almost twice the size of the space shuttle, it's unbelievable. And then knowing that when we finally launch that thing, it is going to put so much power that it's going to rattle windows down in, in central Florida. <laughs> uh, it's going to wake up everybody if you're trying to sleep through it. There's no way you're sleeping through that launch. And so it is going to be the world's most powerful rocket taking off from central Florida. And that's going to be one exciting show for sure. And Dave, just like these uh, young rocketeers out here, this is not the last step for them. We've got hardware and work for more missions than just Artemis 1. Okay, tell us a little bit about some of the th other things that are going for our next Artemis missions and for SLS. Yeah, I mean, I can primarily speak from the position of the boosters. Um, when we first started the program, we knew that we were going to be flying out some of the old shuttle hardware, some of the stuff that we had saved. And so that's a lot of the architecture and the lessons learned that we had learned from shuttle, we've now built into the SLS program. And so we're using some of that same architecture and same hardware. For the boosters, we saved eight flights flights worth of hardware and we actually in booster land we have uh, we're building we've built three sets of those boosters we are build, building the fourth one for, so for the fourth flight um, and then uh, we are also within booster uh, knowing that we're going to run out of this shuttle hardware that we've saved at some point we're starting on the next generation well if once we decided we're going to have to build a new booster design anyway we decided what's the point of just turning the crank again. Let's see what else we can get out of the vehicle. And so we have upgraded this booster and that is what we're currently working on. So in this upgraded uh, booster design, we are switching to a state-of-the-art composite case instead of metal cases like uh, that was used on the shuttle program. Um, when we're switching to a state-of-the-art propellant, uh, we're changing the avionics system. We are changing the way that the boosters will separate because it was optimized originally for separating from the space shuttle and it's different when you separate from the SLS, so we're optimizing that. And of course, because we're going to produce more power out of these boosters, you need a new nozzle and so we're redesigning that. So that's what we're going to call the Block 2 booster. It's basically the next uh, major step for the vehicle. We have three iterations that we're working through and that's the third iteration. So the rest of the vehicle for SLS is currently working on You've got Artemis 1 out on the pad. You've got Artemis 2 in, in uh, finishing things up in the factory. Um, it's going to be shipped to the Cape here in the next year or so to be able to start fabricating it. The boosters are ready to ship to the Cape uh, at some point. Artemis 3, same thing. And Artemis 4, like I said, uh, most of the elements of the different uh, pieces of the SLS are starting to build that hardware because, like I said, we're not just going one launch at a time. We have a long-term mission that we're trying to accomplish in trying to get people on the moon and get them to Mars. That's so awesome. I know I'm excited. I joined the SLS team about a year ago, and it's been nothing but a blast, pun intended. Uh, to be around the program and to see not just the Artemis 1 booster come together, uh, the Artemis 1 uh, launch vehicle come together, but for many more missions. Um, so I guess any advice for these young people out here uh, as they're looking to get their career started in, in rocketry? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say that they're learning it right now, and that is don't be discouraged by setbacks. You're gonna have setbacks. Rocketry is hard. Trying to get stuff from zero miles an hour to 18,000 miles an hour, that's hard stuff. And we're on the, we're, rocketry is currently, on, it's always on the cutting edge because you're always trying to push your hardware further and further and harder and harder and harder. And so obviously you're gonna have setbacks. Um, and so as you have setbacks either in, in this work or you have it in school or you have it just in life, work through it. That's what you do. That's how we have gotten from from uh, banging two rocks together to trying to put people back on the moon. It, it, it's it's 
it's people overcoming these setbacks one step at a time and learning from these mistakes. I think that's probably the biggest lesson that, that anybody can get out of an activity like this or any other activity that, that is uh, related to, to STEM. Well, I think that's great advice, Dave. Thank you so much for coming out, spending some time with us and, and talking to us about SLS. The Space Launch System Program is America's rocket. We're gonna be doing things that we have dreamed of for decades. We're going to send people back to the moon, to a region we've never explored before. We're gonna do cutting edge science. We're gonna develop technologies that are gonna be critical for us going to Mars. It's going to be the generation that is working in the space flight industry now. And these young people that you are seeing out here today, they're gonna to be the ones that make it happen. And we cannot wait and cannot be more excited for you all to be a part of this Artemis team. Uh, we're gonna bring more coverage to you back as our teams are out recovering the, their rockets, more team interviews throughout the day. Hang out with us here, and if you have any questions, remember, hashtag student launch. We're gonna bring, we'll be uh, right back to you. Thanks for joining us for the 2022 student launch finale. Space is for everyone. We're all working towards a common goal. Just seeing people learn and grow and the community benefiting as, as a whole. We have vendors from all around this country and all of that's bringing in uh, a lot of jobs and getting to work in our community. I give back by seeing companies grow. My work means something. It, it provides people with the ability to feed their families. Not everyone who works on the space program is, is an engineer or scientist in a white lab coat, and there's vital roles. Everybody at NASA is very teamwork driven. Nothing that we do here is done by itself. All successful missions come from a team that works together that is diverse and we each bring a different perspective to the team to help us achieve our goals. There's literally an expert kind of within arm's reach that you can ask any question to and you'll probably get one of the best answers in the world. We take a lot of ownership in what we do. You get to see a lot of that passion, you get to see a lot of that drive. People want to do their best. People want to pull together to be a part of this program that's bigger than what any of us can accomplish on our own. NASA does the trailblazing with technology. The kind of work we do, you can't rest on your laurels and say, okay, we're there. There's no end to what we can achieve, so we have to keep pushing ourselves. And any airplane that I get on, it's exciting to think about, oh, this airplane probably at some point passed through many of our centers. We are with you when you fly. We, we are coming up with safer, newer technologies that are more silent, more energy efficient. Just to be able to work here and be able to design and touch something that will one day travel to a new planet is amazing. I mean, the, it's, it's indescribable. NASA brings hope and inspiration by leading the world to space for the progression of all people.
Hey everyone, it is a buzz of activity down here around the flight line. Teams are bringing their rockets in. I see UAH uh, coming in. But most importantly, we have NC uh, A&T right here with us, one of our uh, first teams. Introduce yourself and, and tell us what year you are in school. Okay, so my name is Eugene Lavert. I am a senior at North Carolina A&T. Um, this is my team. If uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick. Hi, I'm Kennedy Boyd. I'm a senior at North Carolina A&T. Uh, my name is Locke Tran. I'm a senior uh, at North Carolina A&T. My name is Unique Johnson. I'm a senior at a and My name is Grant Little. I'm a junior at NC a &T. My name is Tico Coleman. I'm a senior at a and uh, My name is Nevo. I'm a senior at North Carolina a and Hey, I'm Antonio Smith, a senior at a and And let's not forget our member, Mark Oliver, who is also a senior at a and So, guys, it, it's, it's your first year doing student launch. Tell us what that experience has been like. Uh, at first, you don't really realize how exciting this whole event is and how things are going to go since it is our first year. So um, I think it's more like in the last, within the last few weeks or months, it's really been setting in to where, oh my God, you know, we're doing a NASA <laughs> event. So that's, that's like really cool. And we've put in just so much hard work on this rocket and so much of our time. And uh, it, it's just been a really awesome and crazy experience. Uh, had tons of fun doing it uh, I mean I'm so happy I was part of the team and to be able to come out here and this is the first year A&T gets to kind of show its face out here and hopefully we do a great fantastic job and uh, we get invited back uh, more years after that. So you mentioned having a lot of fun and a great experience has there been anything that's has stuck out whether it's from uh, the past few months or or out here today? Well I think it's uh Easy to say that we're all pretty much amateur rocket builders, so it's all our first time really building a rocket. So there has been so many hurdles and so much to learn and experience and trial and error, trial and error over and over again, you know. But uh, honestly, I would say the hardest part of this whole project was really getting those fins 90 degrees and straight, like perfect from each other to avoid that spin. Um, but overall, We've all had a great time, tons of fun. We are, we are so excited to be here. Yeah. That's great. So tell us about your rocket, how high you're hoping to fly, and, and what your payload is to, to tackle this challenge. Okay, so uh, our rocket's about nine and a half feet long, and we have a uh, target apogee of 5,000 feet. And uh, we're really hoping to hit that mark so we could break some NASA records today. And we've worked <laughs> so hard to try to hit it. Um, as far as the payload uh, situation goes, uh, Lock, uh, Unique was our um, avionics payload lead. Grant Little, Little, a volunteer, he's a um, junior at our school, and he's been so much, so much helpful d during this whole procedure. And uh, they, they kind of know about how that works. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it up to them. So for the payload, we'll be using a range finder, and then we'll, we'll be using a Yagi antenna for directional finding. So we'll combine those two to locate our rocket. Excellent. Now, beautiful rocket, awesome paint job. Well, what went into to painting it? Honestly, man, I, we had a subscale. We we're gonna go launch, and it was pretty much made of cardboard and fiberglass. So we're like, I'm like, man, I can't go out in the field with a rocket looking like this. So I was like, I got some blue, some yellow paint. That's our school colors. So I just and my dad is shout out to my dad. He's a body man too. So he does tons of paint jobs on cars. So I figured a nice little fade w would be nice on the fins and the nose cone and try to keep it as clean and simple as possible. Well, it looks great. I might actually have to steal that paint job for uh, for my pickup truck. I, 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 I'm a big fan of, of it. Um, so so y'all are mechanical engineering majors, right? And so is it a departmental effort for the rocket? Is that how y'all became involved? Uh, yes, it's so it's pretty much the, all the seniors from our school mechanical engineering department are uh, split up into groups depending on their skill sets and kind of what they're interested in. And so we have so many different projects and groups going on and we were lucky enough to get picked for this one. So aside from all the student team members, who else has really put in effort to help you out with this project? Uh, shout out to Mark Oliver if you're watching this. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. And uh, we have Caleb as well. He, he was one of our interns, and uh, Professor Esso. Can't forget <laughs> So And this this is the man right here that brought us into this project. So, from a mentor perspective, what's it like uh, to work with such fine students and and to guide them through a, a very challenging project? It's to get a great team of uh, students who are committed to the project and committed to timelines 
and making sure they get the milestones all correct. I thank all of them for being on the mark and on the target because I told them we need to be number one. We, we couldn't do it, and I know these students couldn't do it without you. So uh, a special shout out to all the mentors, all the professors, all the parents, all the family at home. Uh, North Carolina A&T, thank you so much for coming out here. We're so glad to hear you guys have had a good experience. And best of luck on, on your launch later today. We can't wait to see it. Yeah, th thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for uh, Northup Grumman for uh, sponsoring our whole project and this whole event and making this happen. Thank so you. So that, that's you. been really, really appreciative. Super. I appreciate that. Aggie Pride. Aggie Pride. Yeah, Aggie go Pride. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. The team from North Carolina A&T, they're going to be flying uh, out here later today. The first team out there, I'm sure they're excited, uh, and we can't wait to see them fly. So hi, we're here with uh, David Pauls. He's with uh, Lipscomb University, and this is the team. You guys just flew, right? That's right. We uh, had a great flight. We uh, had some uh, some tense moments when our, our uh, we snuffed the first time, but we got a new igniter in there, and we had a beautiful flight. Went awesome. nominally. Now, the, I've, I've been told uh, I've been told that we have to talk about the altimeter. Um, so you guys you guys have recovered the altimeter. So do you guys have a, a, a uh, a measure of how high your rocket went. Do you, do you know that yet? Yeah, we had a max altitude of 5677 feet. Nice. And so that was uh, 397 feet higher than uh, than our target goal. So we're feeling really good about that. Yeah, yeah. That's not bad at all. So y'all drove down from Nashville to do the rocket launch. Yes. So but how much before the drive down the day before launch? How long have you been working on this rocket? We started back in August with our proposal, um, brought the team together, determined our roles, and uh, we've put in 3,500 hours on this project wow. as a team uh, up to this point. Yeah. So that's all your hours as a team. What about um, mentors or other people that supported y'all? Yes. So um, Dr. Elrod, the dean of the College of Engineering, was our advisor, uh, faculty advisor up at Lipscomb University. And Mr. Vince Hugley, we're very grateful to both of them. Uh, Mr. Vince Hugley was actually involved in this competition in its inception um, about 20 years ago. So we got him and we're, we're so blessed to have him because all that experience um, really came in with us. We're a very new team. Um, most of us have no experience with rocketry, but we came in, we learned a lot from them, and uh, yeah, it's so great to, to come to this point and be successful and uh, get to go home proud for, for our team and proud for the university. And do you guys have any sponsors that you need to thank or anything? Yeah. So uh, we had Jacobs Technology down in Tullahoma, Tennessee, um, sponsored us, and the Tennessee Architectural Engineering um, Grant in the Tennessee Space what is it, Tennessee Space, Tennessee Space Grant Consortium, as well as Lipscomb's SGA. So we're, we couldn't have done this without them. So we appreciate that, yeah. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.
So we're here. These uh, this is a, these guys are from somewhere in Florida. I'm not sure exactly where they're from. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. From University of Florida. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, my name is Megan Winack. I'm a third year aerospace engineering student. Awesome. And uh, tell, introduce everybody else. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, these guys have already flown. Uh, what's the nickname of your rocket? Our rocket's name is Alberta, which is the mascot of the Gators. We have Albert and Alberta are the two Gators, so it's Alberta. <laughs> Okay, well, I was just thinking in my head, so I'm not ready for a question, but I called her uh, Alberta yesterday instead of the rocket. So the <laughs> rocket is Alberta. She is Megan. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> So yeah, so your your paint job is, was was fairly uh, was fairly basic. Was did you guys have just is this uh, is this a specific kind of paint or is this look like it's textured somehow, right? Yes. Yeah, so actually, a kind of interesting feature. So our original paint job was very very shiny and sleek, and then our altitude was too high, and we had to come up with a way to bring down our altitude without really modifying our rocket because we were too late in the competition to do that. So we actually emailed the NASA board and said, does paint count? Can we just add paint to increase the weight and the coefficient of drag? And they said, yes. So we've got some more like textured, there's like eight coats of paint on this. And that was able to bring the altitude down almost 300 feet. Nice. So how many inches of paint did you have, did you put on it to bring down? Uh, I don't know about inches, I just know about coats. <laughs> nice. And what was your, do you know your altitude? Have you guys, have you guys got the measurement yet? Four six, uh, four seven six eight. Yeah. Yes. Seven hundred and sixty-eight. Okay. Good. Awesome. Well, what was your what was your target? What did you call? We were one hundred and ninety degrees off. So t uh, feet. Off. feet. <laughs> degrees. Feet. Yeah. So four thousand five hundred and seventy-eight was the um, target. Yeah. So how many members of your team are here to launch? Uh, we've got nineteen. Nineteen here. How many um, are back our home? team has about seventy, but we have nineteen here. Okay. And do you have any sponsors that you want to thank? Uh, yes, Aerojet Rocketdyne is a sponsor of ours. So them and then, of course, the University of Florida Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. Yeah. Well, congratulations, guys. Thank you. Great it's job. good to see you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Go Gators! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cover that up. And... <laughs>so here we're with, uh, we're here with Notre Dame uh, University and you guys uh, the, you're celebrating a milestone here right this is your 10th year here Correct. Yeah, we started in 2013. Uh, we're now 10 years in. We started with a group of uh, six members just doing it for fun um, out of their dorm room or a closet. And now we're at 40 almost working out of a full lab. Um, 28 of us here today. Nice, nice. And uh, introduce yourself if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Jake Shapiro. I'm our project manager this year. I'm a senior mechanical engineer at the University of Notre Dame. 
Nice. Now, you guys have not flown yet, right? Uh, we haven't flown yet today, but this rocket itself has flown three times. Okay. Right. Okay. So good. Um, so what are, what's your target altitude for today? Uh, we're targeting 4,800. Um, our, we have an apogee control system that should be able to reduce our apogee by 400 to 600 feet, we hope. Um, so we've been testing that all year, um, but we'll overshoot that and try to bring it down with some fl actuated flaps. And have you guys tested anything any, anything close to these winds that you're experiencing today at all? Um, yeah, so we're uh, at University of Notre Dame's northern Indiana, so we've been battling weather all year. Um, we pretty much have high winds and cold temperatures every time we're here, so high winds are normal for us, but we love the warm weather today. So I hear you guys want to send out a special thanks to someone or some organizations. Who wants to do that? Um, yeah, we'd love to, you know, thank all of our supporters, family, friends, and alumni especially. Um, one person we'd love to thank is our team mentor, Dave, um, who, who does um, more than we ever ask him to, um, and we wouldn't be able to do this without him. Um, we'd also like to thank Boeing, uh, Celestron, and the University of Notre Dame College of Engineering um, for supporting us all the time uh, throughout the year, every year. Did, uh, your, your paint job is absolutely beautiful. Did, it is. Did, is someone on the team responsible for that, or is that, did you guys do a uh, team job? Uh, so Tyler and Catherine um, orchestrated the paint job, found a professional um, paint shop near us um, and got it done. Um, we really love the carbon fiber clear coat, so we uh, decided to stick with that this year along with our normal school colors of blue and gold. It's absolutely beautiful. It well, is. good luck to you all. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Go Fighting Irish. <laughs> <laughs>
So we started off in August with a team that was consisted of major league people who were very fresh to rocketry, including myself. And um, over the course of two semesters, we've had four, this is our fourth launch. We have launched once in Huntsville and twice in Sampson, Alabama. And progressively, I think the team has made, uh, you know, we've made some phenomenal progress. Um, and I am very proud of my team. We're about 30 members. Um, and we're so excited to have our final launch here. So roll tide. All right, exactly. All right. So um, what I really want to know, you guys have been here before, right? So this is nothing new to you, but tell me about some of the best experiences you've had so far with Student Launch this year. Well, the first time we competed in Student Launch was an, um, was not this team. It was a previous team back in 2016 called Rocket Girls. Okay. Um, so we derived inspiration from them, but as I mentioned, uh, we're all like first time like rocketry uh, amateurs in rocketry, but uh, we've had a fun learning experience. I would say it's nothing short of incredible. Um, and we've had some trials and tribulations, of course, but uh, we emerged from them stronger than ever. Awesome. What kind of awards are you guys trying to achieve this year with Student Launch? Um, there's a bunch that we were targeting, for, but for the most part, we love the 3D printing award yes. that um, Relativity, Re Relativity Space has. Um, and yeah, we've had some pretty cool 3D pr uh, printed parts um, in the um, um, in, in the insides of the uh, rocket, including our payload. So yeah. Okay. Very good. Can you tell us a little bit about what's 3D printed? Yeah, um, I would let my chief engineer take over. Sure. So um, mostly uh, the parts that are 3D printed in our rocket are the avionics bay and the payload uh, retention, retention system and the payload bay itself. Um, we really love this kind of um, sort of designing method because it allows us for rapid prototyping. So as we were able to identify failure points on our uh, design, we were able to rapid, uh, rapidly uh, create a new part and also have that part uh, done by the next day as it is printing overnight in our laboratory. Um, we've had a lot of members in our club that are very experienced uh, with 3D printing, and we're more than happy to have them supporting our team. Excellent. You guys have anybody you need to thank? Uh, any, any crew or any, any uh, team members or any, uh, any sponsors or anything? Oh, first of all, we'd love to thank the University of Alabama and Alabama Rocketry Association, which is our parent organization. Um, we have had some great mentors and support um, all throughout our journey. Uh, but for the most part, I would also like to just thank every single one of my team members out here. We have worked several, you know, long nights, pulled a lot of all-nighters. Um, and we've had some amazing launches so far, and I really look forward to this final launch. So once again, roll tide. That's I, awesome. Well, same thing. I would like to thank the University of Alabama for allowing us with the opportunity to come here to NASA to launch this year. But mostly, I would like to thank all these guys and all everyone that's supporting us back at the ground station. I can only say that all these people are brothers and sisters to me at this point, and I'm more than happy to be working with them. Awesome. All right, before we go off camera, we have to get one really big roll tide before we go. Ready? Oh, boy. On your Three, call. two, one. Roll tide! That's a great job. Keep up the good work and good luck this weekend. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. And we're back again here with yet another student group from uh, the Student Launch 2022 here. Uh, we're out at Bragg Farms again. Uh, introduce yourself. You guys are from um, Virginia Tech, right? Yes, we're from Virginia Tech. My name is Sarah Taylor. I'm the team manager. And go ahead. <laughs> and I'm Blake Wilhelm. I'm the chief engineer. And we're here with a couple of our leads. This is Cody Jones, Rose Stanfill, Helen Salco, Kareem Mohammed, Timon Wendude, Harshan Hay. Uh, I'm so sorry, Taj Kins and our mentor Bob and Avni Singh over there. Awesome. And so tell us a little bit about your rocket. It looks like you guys have signed a little bit of it too there. Yeah, so um, we've done two launches so far. We signed them um, all on our first launch. Um, our sponsors are down here. It's our aerospace department, the Student Engineers Council at our school, Collins Aerospace, and um, our whole team back home. There's about 50 of us has also signed our whole rocket. 
And uh, what, what does, you, you guys have not flown yet, right? You're on your way. So uh, what is your target altitude? 5250, right? Yep. <laughs> you guys, you, in your pre previous flight, you're coming close to that? Yes. Um, our first flight, we were actually only nine feet off the target apogees, and we were super excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yep, and our second flight, we were 83 feet off apogees, so we have a good range that we think we can narrow down uh, with this flight. Uh, we did a bunch of pre-flight analysis uh, yesterday and this morning uh, based on wind conditions to try and get the optimal launch angle and just make sure that all our mass estimates and everything was accurate. And uh, talk about your payload a little bit. What's your payload? Blake will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so our payload uses an IMU uh, on an Arduino, and basically it takes the inertial measurements um, from the rocket as it goes up, and it uses a bunch of integration and numerical methods to kind of, in real time, integrate over time the position, or integrate the acceleration to obtain position. And then on that, we get a real flight map of the ground track, and we're going to fuse that over the gridded map of the launch site. So talk to me about what has been most challenging this year for you all as you've built your rocket and as you've been here and launched already. Yes, yeah, so one of the biggest things that was hard starting out is uh, the few past few years with COVID has really hurt the team. So this year, Sarah and I have really, and Tamim, have really put in a lot of effort to rebuild the team and kind of reorient it and reorganize it so we can be more efficient. And we've seen that in our and how we've done on all of our progress reports. Uh, we've been improving every time, so I think we've been doing very well with that. And as for the rocket, the biggest issues that we've come across is just manufacturers and shipping time. Mm -hmm. I know for our subscale rocket, uh, we ordered over a month in advance and we weren't getting parts until the week before we had to launch, oh, wow. which was right before winter break. And, right, and then the only launch window after that was Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, so we didn't want to do that. So it, it was a real big time crunch for us. But besides that, I mean, we also had issues with manufacturers and uh, shipping times for this rocket. Mm -hmm. I know that the nose cone was ordered over a month in advance and came very late. So we actually ordered two of them and they came in on the same day. Yeah. So, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's probably been our biggest struggles this year. Right, right. Do you guys need to uh, have, have any sponsors you need to thank or anything? Yep, so um, Tamim actually handles our, handles our sponsors. Hey guys, so we'd like to thank, of course, the department. Uh, our, one of our professors, Pat Artis, is here. He's a great help to us, along with Bob. Also, our second biggest sponsor is then going to be the Student Engineers Council, which I was a part of. They gave a lot of money, and they actually helped us travel all the way down here. And then Collins Aerospace, we want to shout out to Brianna Stimson, who's probably watching right now. Mm -hmm. She's helped us out a lot this year, and she really made sure that she worked with us and did a lot of events, even for outreach, to make sure that this rocket was fully built and we were ready for Huntsville. Well, I can tell that you guys are really hardworking despite any of the challenges that you face. Uh, good luck to you guys, and thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. We're glad to be here. That's All so right. Have a good weekend. It. Yeah. Let's go. Hoagies! All right. Let's go, Hoagies.
All right, so we're back again at uh, Student Launch, and this is a, a team. This is from UMass. They've already flown today. Uh, I don't know if you can tell that, but that's because the you know because the rocket is in pieces. That's not you know that's because they have flown. Um, I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourselves. Sure. My name is Max Flera. I'm Ian. I'm Callista. I'm Philip. I'm Liam. Got a mic right there, but you know that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your flight. How did it go? Uh, we think it went really well. Um, it was a good flight. All the recovery events deployed correctly, um, and that's really the name of the game. So. Is yeah. that your altimeter? It is. How'd you do? Uh, pretty good. Uh, we reached an altitude of about seven or 4,900 feet. Um, a little bit off of our target, but we're really happy with the flight profile, and uh, it was a beautiful flight. And our uh, payload, our payload was able to give us a coordinate on our grid system, so we're quite happy about that. Good. Awesome. Good deal. Now, I'm supposed to ask about uh, some of the some of the trials and tribulations you guys had getting to this launch today. That apparently, you guys had some some fun challenges with one of your other launches. Can you want to tell us a little about that? Oh well, yeah, we have actually two launches uh, <laughs> that led to the point. Uh, the first launch was up in St. Albans, Vermont. Um, back in February, so the ground was completely frozen. Uh, we launched just under the threshold of the uh, the wind cap where we'd have to scrub. Um, and rocket was, flight was beautiful, deployed correctly, uh, landed, and uh, the main parachute was picked up by the wind and dragged the whole rocket about a quarter mile through this frozen cornfield, uh, totally shredding the rocket uh, oh, wow. body yeah. there the in the middle. Body. The yeah. whole body was gone, and like we had to rebuild from that. We called it the Nantucket sleigh ride, based off an old whaling term, yeah, right. because that's when the boat got dragged by the whale and it got all damaged. So we had to rebuild the rocket again with phenolic tubing. Uh, that didn't go too well, because in the next launch, uh, it landed and snapped right in half, just because, yeah, just so bad material right there. And well, I was about to ask if this is Mark II, but this is Mark III then. Mark III, Mark III. yeah. And we, we joke, it's named Argo off after Jason and the Argonauts, but we say it's more like Ship of Theseus because we keep changing parts on it. So we, is it the same rocket? I don't know. That's good. Nice. Well, you, you, well, at least you know your, your mythology, I guess. That's true. There right, you yeah. go. So, um, good deal. Uh, I'm supposed to ask you about the Clementines. So what's, tell us your Clementine story. Uh, Liam would probably yeah. be the best one to ask about that. So uh, one of the big staples of our team and tradition is that uh, – Every year we try to eat citrus before our launch, and that's because uh, one year when we went up to St. Albans, Vermont, uh, a group of our uh, members had the rocket motors and black powder in their car, and they accidentally went over to the border to Canada, and they got stopped. And the only thing that they removed from that car was their clementines, not any of the explosives. <laughs> so, you know, ever since then, it's just been part of our tradition to that's eat one. Funny. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really Did you funny. bring clementines for everyone else? Uh, we had, like, one today, but that was it. Oh man, okay. So with all the challenges that you guys have had, uh, talk to us about some of the awards that you're targeting this year. Uh, obviously, we're, we, we tried our hardest at the altitude and payload, but one award that we really think we have a shot at is the 3D printing award, which is new this year, because we have a fully 3D printed uh, avionics bay, as you can see there. We also have a 3D printed camera mount for our secondary payload. And uh, we also have our full payload is has a 3D printed housing and electronic system. So uh, we think we have a good shot on that. Yeah. Nicely done. Nicely done. Um, well, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate it, too. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yes, good job. It's good to have you guys, and good luck this weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank mm -hmm. Hang here with us just for a second.
So we're here with Central Washington University, and you guys are from the center of Washington, I understand. Yes, sir, Ellensburg, <laughs> Washington. Yes. I, th I, think, I think I overheard you saying that that was a place where people stop to get gas when they come through Washington. Is that right? <laughs> or if you're there for the rodeo. The rodeo is a big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. the rodeo. It's, it's, yeah. it's rodeos and rockets now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. And this is your guys' first year? This is our first year competing in the competition in any capacity. Yeah. Awesome. And you, guys are, you guys were in the first, the, the first flight, right? Or yes. The, yes. How, how did it go? It went really well. We're very pleased with the flight. It's super stable. Um, our parachute, one of our uh, shot cords got twisted around uh, one of the shroud lines, so it had this weird half inflated, half deflated look to it. Uh, but it was big enough and had a high enough drag to get us a comfortable soft landing. Uh, our communications unfortunately died for our scientific payload. Uh, battery just didn't work for us. It worked when we checked it and then it didn't work when it flew. Uh, so we didn't get anything from that unfortunately. But we get to take the rocket home and we get to be very proud of it. That's exactly awesome. Right. That's exactly. and, and, uh, and who do you have here with you? <laughs> So this is our STEM engagement lead, Kendra. She was the only member who wasn't able to make it today. So uh, the night before we left, we made this little cutout of her and we brought her along the journey with us. So we wanted to make sure she got her acknowledgement for the amazing work she did for STEM engagement yeah. for us. Um, and we really wish you could have made it here with us. We love yeah. you. Yeah. That's so sweet. She's fantastic. Oh, she's an absolute dream. Yeah, she Well, she so looks like an absolute <laughs> dream, <laughs> even well, we as should, a cutout. We should just interview her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's the yeah, answer. Uh, she's very quiet. She's very quiet. Awesome. Well, congratulations, guys, on your first flight. Yeah. Yes. We would like to thank if you give me Go the time. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, we're a very small university. We're a first year team, and we've had an amazing amount of support from our uh, staff and faculty back at Central Washington. Um, Dr. Dicey Snowden, she's our advisor. She got us all hooked in on this. Uh, T Tammy and Trish King, uh, they have guided us through thick and thin. They've been fantastic. Um, Peter Zenkak, he's a wizard handyman uh, who's fixed every problem we've thrown at him. Mm -hmm. uh, Deanna Marshall, another uh, physics, or not physics anymore, but CW faculty who's helped us through so much. Dr. Aaron Craig got us connected with STEM engagement. Um, Dr. Braunstein, Dr. White, Dr. Kawada, all, everyone, everyone. They've been so incredibly supportive of us. It does sound like you guys have a strong support system. Tell us, what advice would you give another first time student launch team? Yeah, I would. Uh, I think the big one would say it's, it's gonna be kind of rough, but people are here to support you. You will find a support team, reach out. You're not in it alone. Uh, the way we, the way I kind of got everyone in on this is I went and harassed them and said, hey, hey you want to do this rocket thing? Um, Which NASA does not recommend harassment. <laughs> it, it, was, it was friendly harassment. It, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, you, Point you, of clarification. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. You were persistent. There we go. Thank you. Much better PR. <laughs> much, much better. Again, we're here to help you. Thank you. Even Thank bigger you. support yeah. system. Uh, we've had fantastic donors who have made it possible for us to fly down uh, mm -hmm. from Ellensburg. Uh, we've just had a fantastic support system. Other people worth mentioning? Ask questions. Ask questions. There is so much going on. There are so many different requirements that if you're unsure about something, just ask questions. Someone will know the answer, and yeah. it makes your life ten times easier when you ask questions. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, I'd also like to throw a shout out to Davis High School and Ridgeline mm -hmm. High School for letting us come down and launch rockets with you guys, teach you guys. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, and we hope you all compete in this in the future. We hope we got you into rockets. I think just have fun with it. I mean, it's kind of, if you don't get along as a group and you don't get along as a team, you're not going to make a good rocket. You kind of have to learn. We had a lot of team bonding and a lot of experiences where we learned a lot of new things and a lot of different things about each other. And it kind of helped us figure out where we all fit in and what we all could do together. Awesome. And are, are, are all of you guys seniors? What, are, what, what year are you? No? I think about six of us are seniors. Five or six of us are graduating. Uh, the rest of us are uh, still students and those of us that are graduating are going to graduate school, going into business, going all over the place. Yeah, so. so are we coming back next year or what? I'll keep you posted. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. You better persistently keep us posted. <laughs> For you, Tracy. <laughs> I made a friend today and his name is Henry. This is all about friendships. It really is. Guys, awesome. listen, you guys have done uh, such an amazing job making it here. You're a first year team. You, it sounds like you've had good experiences. You can share advice. Um, we're just so happy to have you guys here and good luck to you this weekend. And we do hope to see you back. We do hope to see you back. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes, hope to see you back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes.
All right, and we're here with Auburn University, and uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Dustin Harris. I'm the project lead at Auburn. I'm a senior in aerospace engineering. Okay, now, see, this is my first year here. I have to, I have to, I have to fess up for a second. This is my first year uh, at the student launch. Tell me about the shirts, because they're a little conspicuous. Of course. Uh, this, is, this is actually a long-running tradition. About five years back, the team decided to do Hawaiian shirts. And then the next year, we got uh, custom shirts with like little insignias attached on. Uh, and it's just uh, everyone always comments on the shirts, so we keep keep doing it. I feel either under or overdressed. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Gee, uh, we just got to request a shirt next I guess, year. I guess that's it. I guess that's <laughs> it. So tell us about your rocket. Uh, sure. Well, it's it's a very heavy rocket. It's uh, a 55-ish, 58 pounds. Uh, it has um, an air brake system right here. Here, let me come around this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has an air brake system, if you can see. We have two cameras on board to catch your in-flight video. Uh, we have a payload system in the top part of the rocket, um, which will do the payload mission. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. What's your payload? Uh, it is a basically a sundial to find the direction of the rocket, and then we have a sort of like an echolocation system uh, to determine how far away we are. Very so. Cool. Very cool. Yes. so what type of awards are you guys targeting this year? Uh, well, we always try and go for uh, Team Spirit Award, of course. Oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's only right. Uh, it's only right. Uh, of course, social media is very important to us as well, so we, we would love to be chosen for that award. Um, but honestly, the, the other awards are very important as well. Altitude and payload are very, very important to us. Uh, but yeah, I mean, with the air brake system, we're, we're trying to get as close as we can to the target altitude. So, What's your target? Uh, target's 4,200 feet. All right. And, and uh, how many times have you flown it thus far? We've flown twice so far. So it's it's well tested. And how close have you gotten to that to that target so far? Uh, first time we were under a couple hundred feet, um, and then the second one we had to launch on a separate motor because we were out uh, supply chain issues. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that one we actually got four feet from the new target that we set for that motor. So, all right, is there any sponsors? Anybody you need? You guys need to thank? Of course, yes. Uh, we'd like to thank the Alabama Space Grant Association uh, and also Dynetics and Boeing. Uh, we'd also like to thank our advisors, Eldon Triggs and Rob Kulik. Uh, yeah, and Auburn University in general. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so I know you guys have, Dustin, you said you're a senior, right? Yes. Um, obviously, you guys have been here before because of the Hawaiian shirt tradition. Uh, how much of the team is new? How many of you guys are seniors? Oh, uh, we probably have a good 30% new people. Okay. Uh, and probably around the same amount of seniors, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a lapse in recruitment because of the COVID. Right. But, um, but yeah, I think we re definitely rebounded this year and recruited a whole bunch of new members, and mm -hmm. we're definitely primed to come back year after year. Awesome. Here on out, yeah. So tell me, what have you guys learned? I know you said we're coming back year after year, new Hawaiian shirts. T and I are going to have one next time. Absolutely. We thank you in advance. Uh, but talk to us about some of the things that you guys have learned as a team over the years and how you've implemented that for the launch this year. Of course. Well, we realize that engagement is one of the most important things in a club, especially a university club, when people have other things going on, like tests and that sort of thing. Uh, so we, we decided to hold like we weekly meetings so people know when and where to show up consistently. Uh, we also have way better communication with our group me messaging um, for the, the sub teams. Uh, and also we've been holding more social events this year. We had a movie night a while back and yeah, and a trivia night recently. That was a lot of fun. All right, you got anything, anything else you guys need to or want to say or anything? Uh, Iggy, you want to say anything? All right. Can I, I can I get a War Eagle of course. from you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Right. War Eagle. On three. Oh. One, two, three. War Eagle! Eagle. All right. I can't join into that, guys. So <laughs> I just can't.
Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Washington, and we are here live just north of Huntsville, Alabama at Bragg Farm for the 2022 Student Launch Competition. I have my colleague here with me, Ryan, and I, I, I'm so impressed by your jacket. Ryan, I really just wanted to take a minute and, and ask you to explain how this came to fruition, because it's awesome. Oh, I appreciate that, Tracy. Yeah, you know, um, this jacket, like many things I think we all have in our lives, is kind of took on a life of its own. A, a jacket that was destined just to have a NASA patch on there soon became um, a jacket where I had to have some patches that were close to me and personal. Um, my dad had an experiment fly on STS-87 and STS-95. And so, of course, those had to join. And then different launches, I've been fortunate to fortunate enough to see a number of launches in person mm -hmm. you know those of course have to go on yeah. and um growing up here in rocket city with a dad who who not only works for for nasa and marshall but has a deep 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 passion for it it became a, I, I tell people I, I got bit by the nasa bug and no matter what i do i can't get rid of it I hear um, and i don't want to yeah so um i i like to try to honor the crews we've uh we've lost crews on aboard Space Shuttle Challenger, Space Shuttle Columbia, and the Apollo right. 1 crew. So try to honor them um, and then celebrate our history, the very first flights with Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. And actually, one of the cool things, and I've got the patch on my back. Yeah, turn around, let us see the back. Yeah. That's awesome. So cool. So, on the back, kind of lower center, is the Apollo 16 mission. Mm -hmm. And Apollo 16, 50 years ago right now, Charlie Duke and John Young were exploring the lunar highlands. Mm. They were going to a portion of the moon that we hadn't been to before. But to think about 50 years ago, right now, yes. we had two astronauts walking on the moon and Ken Mattingly and Casper orbiting. Yes. Now, for any of you guys, for any of you space buffs or anybody here in Rocket City out, out here in the field, the Apollo 16 capsule is at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, just a few miles away from where we're standing. Mm. So make sure you go check out Casper. Charlie Duke was here a few nights ago. Oh, that's and, awesome. um, standing in front of the capsule that kept him safe and home yeah. so it's just it's a pleasure to honor the history and then down here at the bottom i've got two of my favorite patches the artemis program patch and the artemis one patch yeah. we're getting ready to fly the first artemis mission we are going and we are going and mm -hmm. it's going to be absolutely incredible i can't yes. wait we talked with dave reynolds earlier he talked about uh, just the sensation of, of what that feeling that blast is going to be like hearing how loud it's going to be that's one of the things that I just keep thinking about and, and can't wait for. Yes. One last question for you, Ryan. I know you were telling me earlier that you've used this jacket to actually educate students about NASA. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I was fortunate enough to do my master's degree at the University of Arkansas. They have uh, have the Center for uh, Center for Space and Planetary Sciences. And uh, I studied Mars geology. Mm -hmm. And as part of what I did, um, I love to go out and talk to kids. And so between this, uh, between, with this jacket, and I've got some meteorites in my pocket that I've been able to acquire over the years, um, I've been able to teach the space program essentially off my jacket out in the middle of fields or in libraries um, out in Northwest Arkansas. That's awesome. Well, it is so good to have someone so knowledgeable uh, that has been able to reach out to our students and then you're here today. So thank you so much for sharing, Ryan. And I don't know about you, launches. Oh yeah, no, they, they, let, they let us come out and play. This is a, a blast. It's so impressive to see what these teams are doing. You get to see a lot of friendly faces, a lot of schools that over the years you've gotten accustomed to. And, and um, I'm looking out here behind you at all the beautiful rockets on the launch rails and uh, we'll be seeing some more rockets flying. Uh, thank awesome. You. It's a beautiful day here in Tony, Alabama at Bragg Farms. We are going to be launching some more rockets here very soon. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more of the 2022 student launch.
Hey everyone, we are back with Dillard University. Uh, great colors on the shirts. Uh, first, uh, tell us your name and what year you are in school. Hi, my name is Zach Bassin. I'm currently a junior at Dillard University and I'm a physics major. Hi, my name is Alana Bell. I am currently a freshman at Dillard University. I am a physics major with a math minor and a concentration in pre-engineering. Oh. Hey guys, my name is DeMarco Smith. I'm a junior in chemistry and chemical engineering, and that's me. <laughs> so now we understand you're a small team. Is this your first year here at Student Launch? Right, yeah, yeah, it is. This is our first year, and as of right now, we're just a design team. You know what that means. Pretty much just making sure that all the dimensions and everything is correct. But we kind of want to just come out here and just kind of in, in, enjoy everything and just kind of take it all in and everything. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot that you're able to pick up from the teams that, that are out here. Uh, what's your experience been like as, as a design team in first year in student launch? The experience has been very of learning how to actually be a, a professional in the professional realm, but also just in the academic realm of this actual project, learning how to present to, high, to, to higher ups, as well how to network and, and everything of that nature. So it, it's been very cool and everything yeah now we understand your rocket has a number of payloads Correct, uh, yeah. almost the same number of payloads as team members right Correct, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes actually it's very ironic that we actually have three payloads so we have p1 which serves as our main payload then we have two p2 which kind of serve as our sub payloads and everything and the p2s you know that that can sit at the micro beacon the camera and then the p1 also can serve as our Admiral 2 pro which when it launches they able to read whether uh, trajectories and everything like that yeah yeah so there's been a lot of teams that have launched so far what's a team that has stuck out to y'all I like Purdue I like Purdue Purdue was yeah. Purdue was a good one but uh, one of my favorites so far I would have to say hmm, Purdue as well yeah Purdue yeah. so uh, Personally, to answer that question, I'll probably say NC State is probably my favorite just because of the way how they kind of carry themselves in terms of the professionalism, once again, and the way how their, their rocket actually looks. I, I, I really like it. Yeah, and say, NC State is a team that is here year after year. We love seeing, seeing the Wolf Pack come out. Have you guys learned some things that, uh, from some of these other rockets that you'll take into next year? Absolutely, yeah. We were actually discussing it a couple minutes ago. One of the major things was the track. On the, on the actual motor and actually being able to see it come down and everything. I, I thought that that was very innovative that, that we can probably involve into our own, own rocket. Maybe put some of those additives in there so you get that nice black plume yeah. as you're launching. Yeah. I, spoke to some of the mem I spoke to some of the members um, from the Purdue team and they kind of, I talked to them about their parachute because that's also very important when you're thinking about the weight of your overall rocket and recovering. Awesome. Well, do you guys have any sponsors, anybody back home you want to thank? Yeah, I would like to thank my family just for being supportive of me. Got from my brother, my mom, my dad, my...
the sun. Need an event. There's an event. All right. Looks looking good. So the really small drogue is out. And again, there's a lot of heavily modified types of electronics in this one. And see that little smoke you can see? That's the tracking smoke from the motor. Again, the motor has a tracking smoke built into it. Helps it easier to find to spot when it's coming in under recovery. Main is set for 550 feet. Coming down pretty good at a pretty good rate, which is okay. We're, about, we're below 1,000 feet right now. Approaching 750. We should be at 500 here pretty soon. There it is. All right. Looking good. Nice job, team. It's also really cool to see the other teams applaud and, and celebrate each other on that. So really cool teamwork out here. It's coming in on this nice slow descent. And it is halfway down. And it is down. Good flight. Okay, so we're going to actually stay on the far away back pads. We're going to pad number 64. So that's going to be one to the right of the one that just took off. This is Washington University in St. Louis. Yep, and they are in St. Louis, Missouri on pad 64. The name of this rocket is Osiris. It's a 34-pound rocket, just over 5.5-inch diameter, 7.5 feet tall. This does say after, oh yeah, this after landing in a tree, they successfully recovered it with an apple picker and are flying it today. So they were nice able to get that rocket back. This does have a Pyra grid type of experiment. So it has an IMU based inertial navigation system that's running on a Raspberry Pi with Python. This rocket is flying on an L1150 Redline Aerotech, main set for 600 feet. Should go 5,000 feet in altitude. I do remember looking at this rocket. Everyone on this rocket, they sign their name, which is about half the body length of the rocket. This one also does a dual deployment, but not in a normal sense. So the drogue is in the top side. The main is, in the, is actually in the bottom side of the rocket. This is their second time competing in SLI, but is their first time here in Alabama. Also, they actually saw the US Space Rocket Center yesterday, so they're even more inspired after touring the U.S. Space and Rocket Center here in Huntsville. So they are really looking forward to uh, doing more with rocketry. Pad 64, we have a clear sky. I got the thumbs up. Clear range. We are going to launch OSIRIS in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Okay, on its way to 5,000 feet. A little left of the sun, starting to go over just a little bit. That's probably all 5,000 feet there. Still starting to arc over. There's an event. Okay, parachutes out. Not as excited on this one, it sounds like, but it's looking good. Main is set for 600 feet for this one. So it's starting to come back towards the still under drogue parachute. Still probably 2,500 feet up. Again, main is set for 600 feet. Approaching 2,000 feet right now. Probably about 1,000 feet now. There's, there is 600 feet. Oh, now the crowd's really excited about that, and that's their backup charge. So... So on this one, everyone, point at it, heads up, point at it, point at it, folks, let your neighbors know, heads up, point at it, stand up, point at it, don't touch it, heads up, point at the rocket, point at the rocket. You don't need to run from it, you just got to step out of the way of it. 
We don't want to cheer for that. <laughs> okay. Rocket is down. Okay, again, with that rocket, don't touch it. Let the team that's involved with it touch it. Might want to get that parachute collapsed relatively quickly. Doesn't drag your rocket. Hear a lot of chatter from the crowd. So, yes, when that rocket's coming in, you just want to point at it and let your neighbors know. We will resume rocketry. We still have some rockets on the launch pad, so we'll want to turn and face towards the rockets. So now we're going to the close pads. We're going to pad number 34. This is Portland Rocketry out of Portland, Oregon. The name of this rocket is Asgard. It's 11.3 pounds, fairly light. Four inches in diameter, six feet, eight inches tall. So this rocket does have an advanced self-guided autonomous recovery device. It's also using a GPS, that's why it's called Asgard, to track its location, which will help analyzing weather patterns as we are providing data for, oh, for achieval of the rocket. So this is one of the SLI comp, uh, competition rockets. This should be going, or this is planning to go 5,000 feet. Let me make sure my little note. Portland. Not sure on the motor, so I guess it'll just be a mystery motor when it takes off. This is their first time here, and there are six people on the team. I also did find out Asgard does tie into Thor's house. I did not know that. And they also have a new avionics bay on here. So it's the blue and gold rocket, and it's a conglomerate of students all across the Portland area. Pad 34, we have a clear sky. I have the thumbs up. We have a clear range. I see a lot of cameras pointing at it. So we're going to launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. So it was a form of a red line motor. Supposed to go 5,000 feet. That high cloud haze is a little tricky on the eyes right now. Did anyone see an event on that one? Well, we know it's not in orbit. I don't think it went high enough for that. But my eyes are not kind to me right now. Is it under parachute? It's under parachute. OK, that's good. Oh, yep, I see it. So just to the right side below the sun, right of the LCO desk, coming down under Drogue. Main is set for 500 feet. We're about 1,000 feet right now. Off to the right side of the LCO desk, we're about 750. We're at 500 right there. There's the main event. Parachute's not quite opening. Oh. a little bit more energy on the landing than normal or what they're planning for, but it might be okay. We got a little nice couple sympathy claps, so thank you, everyone. So we're going now to pad number 35. So this is, again, just to the right of the front bank pads here at the LCO desk. This is Team Hydra. This is Mathmania Robotics. They are from Cota de Casa, Orange County in California. The name of this rocket is Typhon. It is 24 and a half pounds, four inches in diameter, seven feet, seven inches tall. 
Typhon is the father of the Greek mythological creature Hydra. We will beat the university teams at their own challenge. They wrote this. I did not say this. Oh, they said just kidding with the smiley face. But they did place fourth in Tark and won some substantial dollars. And this was for the 8th to 12th graders on the team. So they are, as an SLI team, they are doing the full USLI competition. This does have computer vision plus IMU fused approach using a scale invariant feature, transforms SIFT to identify landing location along with an IMU to account for drift since the last analyzable photo is taken. I sound so smart saying all that, but I have zero idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so the other thing, the other thing with this project is planning to go 4,900 feet, and it is flying on a Cesaroni K 1085 White Thunder. So this is going to take off with a pretty good movement on it. And the main is set for 500, 550 feet. Pad 35 on the right side. We have a clear sky. We have a clear range. We are going to launch Typhon in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Little wiggly, but good on the up. You heard that whistle because it has split fins on that. When the, when the air goes over those fins, you get that extra whistle at burnout. There is an event. Looks, that looks like the main might be out. That looks like a pretty good sized parachute to be at 4,900 feet. Or their drogue is very, very large. Straight up, just towards the sun. Don't look at the sun. Do not look at the sun. Look left of the sun. You will see the Team Hydra rocket. And it's, and you can see what the rocket's doing. It's not moving much. The upper level winds are much less than they are at surface level. And I, I'm pretty sure that's the main parachute. It's still way up there, well over 4,000 feet, straight up. Yep, point those antennas straight up. That's where your rocket is. So one of the things we do in NAR is we do parachute duration rockets, but for this event, we were not going for a parachute duration. But this one's got some good hang time on it right now. It's still way up there. So this is a K parachute duration. They might be setting the record. So still above 3,000 feet. Thankfully, the winds are not very active up there. So the rock is just kind of taking its time. Not a lot of horizontal drift on it for the moment, but even the winds kind of died down a little bit as well. Does anyone locally here know what the next county over is? <laughs> might be where it is. Oh, someone said it might land in Tennessee. I hope not. So. No, it's not going to Georgia. Tennessee is that way. Georgia is the other way. <laughs> so, do you want to go to the next one? Okay, we're going to move on because if we wait for that rocket to land, we might be flying on Sunday. So, we want to keep moving on. Okay, for those that aren't involved with Team Hydra, you can flip back around. We're going to go back to flying rockets. So we're going to pad number 44. This is Aggie Rocketry. This is North Carolina A&T State University from Greensboro, North Carolina. The name of this rocket is Aggie Comet. It's 35 and a half pounds, 5.16 inch diameter, 9 and 3 quarters feet long. This is flying on an Aerotech L1520 Blue Thunder. 
So this one does have a Yagi antenna. Sorry, um, so this, this rocket does have a Yagi antenna and a rangefinder. The launch vehicle will be tracked using a Yagi antenna and rangefinder. The Yagi calculates angle of arrival, and the rangefinder uses radio waves to calculate distance. Also, with this, with this group, they have, they have the ability to add and subtract weight in the payload section, and they actually do have a really sizable radio ground station. And for the payload, it says no ejection for the payload part of it. This one is supposed to go 5,000 feet. Oh, and the fun thing with this rocket, this rocket did land in a tree, but it was a good thing because below that tree was a bunch of pig manure. So this one is free and clear of any manure on this rocket. So we're going to go to pad 44. I have the thumbs up for the clear sky. The range is clear. Pad 44, Aggie Comet is going to fly in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Also right into the Nice straight up boost. That's definitely probably on its way to 5,000 feet. Starting to arc over. There's an event. Okay, we do have a parachute out on that one. Main is set for 564 feet. I don't know why it has to be 564, but that's what the flight card says. And that one is coming down a lot quicker because it is on a drogue parachute. So just to the uh, left of the sun, don't look into the sun. Use a way to block the sun from your eyes. Okay, just below the sun. Okay, again, we're go it's about 2,000 feet now, probably close to 1,000. We're probably at that 560 feet, there's 564. All right. So Iowa State, we don't have your flight card. You can't fly a rocket because we don't have your flight card. Okay. While we wait for your card, we're gonna we will go to the next rocket. Don't need to run. You could just walk briskly, but don't need to run. Okay. So, okay, we're going to pad number forty-five. This is Auburn University. Rocketry Association. This is Auburn University out of Auburn, Alabama. The name of this rocket is Ferdinand. 57 and a half pounds, so it's a heavy rocket. Probably the heaviest one I've seen so far. Six inches in diameter. Just shy of 11 feet tall. This is flying on an Aerotech L2200 Mojave Green. The social, or the, oh, sorry, this does have the air brake system on board. It says it's simming to 40, between 4,200 and 4,300 feet. The project name is Magellan. It does have a Marco Polo system on it. It has a new take, a new take on an age-old sundial technology to log bearing their payload using eco-locating to find the distance. There is a lot going on there. Oh, and this does also have the grid fins to find the target altitude. One thing about Auburn, you'll always know when they're here because they love the Hawaiian-themed shirts. I don't know the story behind that, but, yes, yeah, they're very proud of their, of their um, attire. So I do like to see that. And also my best friend here, his name is Solder. Solder is in the house. He really likes to solder stuff. And this is the project with all the systems in it. When I talk to them, they have a three- Cocentric Lazy Susan system, so they took their mom's kitchenware. I don't know what's going on there. They have a leg system, a scissor lift system, 
and a microphone system. There's a lot of systems going on. They also put on here as a comment, War Eagle. I don't know what that means, War Eagle. We'll figure that one out later. Pad number 45. We are going to launch this one in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Their fins deployed. Oh, their fins deployed, so it's starting to... Grid fits came off a little early. Oh, it's trying to hit at certain altitude. There is an event. Supposed to go 4,200 feet. Parachute is out. And the main on this one is set for 650 feet. All right, so we're about 1,000 feet, so 650, we should see something else happen. Very small drogue, so it's coming in pretty quick. We're about 650 now. There it is. Oh, we need a little more air or something. Oh, no, that's, that's got a little energy on the landing. It is down. I can see exactly where it is. Okay, keeping on. So we're going to the far back pads, the rocket furthest left. This is, the name. team name is Cyclonch. Iowa State University of Ames, Iowa. They didn't put the name of their rocket, so they must have filled this card out in a hurry. But the name of it says, uh, oh no, the name of the rocket is Craig. I don't know what the story is behind Craig, but that's the name of it. 43.8 pounds. It is 6.2 inches in diameter, and it says 145 feet tall. I think they meant 145 inches tall, because I don't think it's 145 feet tall. It is flying on Aerotech L2500 Super Thunder, so it's going to have some umph to it, and it does have an inertial navigation system. So with uh, Iowa State here, this is projected to go 5,000 feet. The, the, this team did also say they wanted their rocket to be just a little bit bigger than the previous year team. So that's how they settled on 145 feet tall, which I think it's inches. And they also have a unique way to use old tennis balls. They use that as their anti-zippering device. So another way for some cool ways of doing ingenuity. On pad number 43, we will launch in five, four, Three, two, one, ignition. That wow. That's a super thunder motor for you folks. A little squiggly on the way up, on its way to 5,000 feet, which probably will do it. Now it's almost straight up, just to the left of the sun. There is an event. There's the smoke from the motor ignition. Okay, we have a drogue parachute out. And the team doesn't seem to care. <laughs> They're like, we expected that, so we're not going to clap. <laughs> so is this, this isn't the Hawkeye. No, not Hawkeyes. This is Cyclones. So then the main on this one is set for 550 feet. This one is pretty close to straight up above us at the LCO desk. So we're about 2,000 feet. So, folks, uh, we're going to give this one a heads up, point at it, look at it, let your neighbors know, because it is not have a main parachute yet. It's not 550 feet. We're about 1,000 feet right now. Heads up, point at the rocket, let your neighbor know. There's your main. Again, still point at this rocket because of where it's going. Still close. Point at it. Let your neighbors know, heads up on this rocket coming in under parachute. He looks like it might be swinging out to the wheat. Can't see from here. 
Okay, it is down. Iowa always likes to keep it interesting. Iowa State, not Iowa, Iowa State. Okay, we're going now to pad number 60. Pad 60, this is Prometheus Alabama Rocketry Association. This is from the University of Alabama out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The name of this rocket is Prometheus. It is 48 and a half pounds, just over six inches in diameter, 10 and a half feet tall. It is flying on an Aerotech L1940 propellant X. Um, this is. Okay, right now we're going to hold, so we had that rocket kind of come in close. We're going to adjust the pad, so right now we're on a temporary hold. We don't need rockets coming into the crowd. Even though it's under parachute, still don't need it. So we're going to adjust the rocket pads just a little bit further out, so we're on a temporary hold right now.
Artemis mission will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And today's students are the Artemis generation. If you're a student, you can design and build technologies that support the Artemis mission with NASA's Artemis Student Challenges. No matter your background or experience, you're invited to choose a challenge that interests you, whether it's rockets, robots, tools, software, vehicles, or other technologies, there's an exciting challenge for you. So find a mentor and build a team of students. Review the rules and requirements. And bring your ideas to life with NASA's Artemis Student Challenge. Visit stem.nasa.gov slash Artemis and see how you can join one of NASA's mission-related student challenges. Welcome to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Developing new technologies and maturing proven systems are at the core of how Marshall is powering the future of space exploration. Marshall's test area is critical for ensuring engines, engine components, thrusters, and custom-designed test fixtures can withstand the extreme forces of launch, ascent on flights, and travel in space. Our test area capabilities are also used by NASA partners to mature innovative technologies developed by American industry to support space exploration. These test areas were invaluable when analyzing hardware for the Space Launch System rocket managed by Marshall. We built new state-of-the-art stands to test the liquid hydrogen tank and liquid oxygen tank for the Artemis missions. Our in-house work to assemble and apply thermal foam protection to the Space Launch System Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter is just one example of how our facilities and engineering skills can support current and future NASA needs. Marshall facilities and the people that work in them are supporting technologies such as in-space storage and transfer of cryogenic propellants used for deep space travel, transit systems for getting to and off Mars, and lunar systems for traveling, working, and staying on the moon. We are using the knowledge we've gained from our Lunar Lander testbed programs as we work with multiple industry partners to design, develop, test, and deliver human-rated lunar landers. Marshall leads the Human Landing System program, which will return American astronauts to the moon under Artemis. Not only is Marshall integral in landing humans back on the moon, we are also maturing approaches for Artemis Base Camp surface habitats and a Mars transit habitat to support surface operations on the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. Years of work developing environmental control and life support systems for the International Space Station has prepared us for building the systems needed for our next great leap, living and working on the moon and eventually Mars. Living and working on the moon and one day Mars will require us to use the lessons we've learned from the International Space Station at the Payload Operations Integration Center, Marshall supports the space station 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, coordinating all scientific experiments on the orbiting laboratory. Hardware designed, built, and managed by Marshall, such as the four-bed CO2 scrubber, provide valuable data and state-of-the-art support system capabilities to help future explorers breathe easier on the moon and future long-duration missions. Going back to the moon and on to Mars requires innovative solutions to many challenges. How do we repair tools that have been broken on Mars? Is there a way we can manufacture large structures in space? Engineers and scientists at Marshall's Advanced and Additive Manufacturing Facility are doing work to answer those questions and many more. Figuring out solutions to challenges is what we do best at Marshall. Nowhere is that better demonstrated than with our unique expertise in space nuclear technologies. This work comes to life in our nuclear thermal lab with testing of concept designs, fuel material development, and manufacturing techniques that are critical for deep space exploration and sending the first humans to Mars. Deep space exploration also requires powerful spacecraft, satellites, and in-space observatories. Marshall's work with developing X-ray mirrors in our optics lab has resulted in developing mirrors for the James Webb Telescope and imaging X-ray polymetry explorer.
okay, we're, we re-angled the pass a little further away so when it comes in for a landing, better chance to avoid all of us here in the crowd. This is Notre Dame rocketry team. This is University of Notre Dame in South, South Bend, Indiana. Name of this rocket is Camulus X, 51.43 pounds, 6 inch in diameter, 11.17 feet tall. It is flying on an Aerotech L2200 Mojave Green. Um, this one does say it has a launch vehicle identification system, does have a strap down inertial navigation system. So I remember looking at this rocket, had a lot of carbon fiber in it. This one is actually supposed to go to 5,600 feet, but it does have an air brake system to, that makes it go to 4,800 feet. It's what they call the penguin system. So for anyone that's in the crowd, put your hands out, put your hands out, close them to your side. That's their penguin system. Out, down, out, down, penguin system. The other thing with this group, they've used some of the biggest quick links in a project I've ever seen in my life. I think it's the quick links that could uh, tow a boat trailer or could tow a boat, and they used a lot of carbon fiber in it. The other thing with this group, this is their 10th anniversary competing in the SLI, and this is a fairly large team. They have 45 members in their team. 28 of them are here today. And with their 45-member team, 28 are from, from 28 different states four different countries, three different U.S. territories. When I think of Notre Dame, I think of the movie Rudy. I did find out and confirm they do play the movie Rudy every year at their stadium. So pretty cool they do that every year. Okay, pad number 61, Camulus X. We have a clear sky. I have the thumbs up. We have a clear range. Rockets pointed down range. We're going to launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. So the penguin system is supposed to, just past the sun, the penguin system is supposed to prevent it to go to 5,600 feet, have it go to 4,800 feet, starting to arc over, right towards the sun. There is an event, there is its backup. Okay. There is a drogue parachute out, looking good. So we're still probably about 3,000 feet. So this team, their head of marketing at Notre Dame, they did tell me and inform me to notify the group. They said, go Irish. They just wanted to point that out. That's their head of marketing. So we're about 2,000 feet. The main is set for 576 feet. We are about 590 feet, coming up to 576. There it is. There was an event, but there's no parachute. The backup saved it. That's why you use a backup, folks. And the crowd, I see some jumping up and down, so they are very excited and satisfied for sure. Congratulations. Sounds like someone's saying, let's go down there. So now we're going back to pad 60. Okay, this uh, pad 60 is Prometheus, Alabama, Rocketry Association, University of Alabama and at Tuscaloosa. Name of this rocket is Prometheus, 48 and a half pounds, 6.17 inch diameter, 10 and a half feet tall. Is flying an Aerotech L1940X, main is set for 800 feet. Um, this does have Prometheus Integrated Camera System. I like the acronym. It says PIX. It's taking pictures of the launch field and using a machine learning to process and compare pictures to grid view of launch field and transmit coordinates to ground station. That is really cool. It's a very complex project. I think I got the gist of it. Definitely above my pay grade, but it's really cool to see. The thing with this rocket, and I noticed when they were building, or noticed when it came through the table, this has some very heavy-duty carbon fiber fins. 
looked like some 10 ounce or greater. The only comment they said about their fins is they said the rock broke. Their fins are that strong, it broke a rock. This does have a new payload. They said the last one was bye-bye. It's supposed to go 4,300 feet. And what happened, unfortunately, with that first payload is it landed in a creek. So to be safe and smart, they did a whole new payload and all did all the right testing, and it's all good to go. So pad number 60, we're going to launch Prometheus. Thumbs up for a clear sky. We have a clear range. We will launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. There it goes. This is supposed to go 4,300 feet. It might do that. Starting to go over. Yep, we are in Alabama. Starting to arc over. There is an event right above the sun. Yeah, I can hear the crowd. Someone said, are we in Alabama? Last time I checked, we are. Just right in the sun right now. Oh, just below the sun. Main is set for 800 feet on this rocket, coming in pretty good. Relatively small drogue, and that small drogue is to help it minimize its distance of where it's landing, keeps it close to where it took off. We're about 1,000 feet right now. We should be at 800 feet right there. They are very excited over there. Nice good parachute on that one, and then... The way they have as much carbon fiber on those fins, they are indestructible, so they will be good to go on the fins. I just cut wheat. <laughs> they are very excited. Okay, pad number 63, we have NASA SLI at Virginia Tech. Okay, this is a Virginia Tech out of Blacksburg, Virginia. The name of this rocket is called MK-16. So I said, what does MK-16 stand for? For some of those that probably know, it is the name of the Iron Man suit. So that is the reason why it's MK-16. It is 35.44 pounds, five inches in diameter. This one's 125 feet tall, but I think they meant inches, 125 inches tall. Does have drogue deployment. Uh, after Apogee, backup is 25 after main deployment, 700 feet backup at 600 feet. This is flying on a Cicerone L1720 White Thunder. I've got it. And for the science experiment, this is called the Akina Project, which stands for the uh, Greek goddess. So the payload uses sensors in order to determine its propulsion autonomously. It is mounted in a removable sled that is bolted to a fiberglass structure, and I believe that's 3D printed. Also, a couple other things with this. It's supposed to go 5,250 feet. On their practice flight, it was within nine feet of that altitude, so they feel very confident they're going to be able to hit that. Oh, and their university, so Virginia Tech is in its C sequential 150-year anniversary. Oh, the one thing I was supposed to say, if I say, let's go, let's go, let's go, okay, I got it. All right, so on pad 63, we'll fly MK-16. We have a thumbs up for clear sky. We have a clear range. We are going to launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Okay, so it's headed to 5,250 feet. 
Main is set for 700 feet. Need an event. There is an event. There is its backup. Drogue is out. It's looking good. Okay, the other thing I noticed with this project, there is a team member named Helen. So today, this day, is Helen's 21st birthday. I didn't say that. She's going to have some refreshments this evening, I believe. So happy birthday, Helen. Okay, we're still about 3,000 feet up. Ah, probably closer to 2,000 feet. Main is set for 700 feet, so we're coming up on 1,000 feet right now. 900, 800. This would be 700 right here, so we need an event, and there it is. All right, congratulations and happy birthday, Helen. I can't sing happy birthday, so someone will have to lead that off a little bit later. Pad 65, we have YC Student Launch. This is Yamhill Carton High School, Carlton High School in Yamhill, Oregon. The name of this rocket is Mind Blown. It is 28.8 pounds, 5.5 inches in diameter, 9 feet, 2 inches tall. Thrust to weight is 6.5. It's supposed to go 3,700 feet to Apogee, although they also say 2,500 feet. So we've got two different sets of notes on here. We'll find out how high it goes. It's flying on an Aer um, Aerotech K480. So this one's not going to take off as fast, if I'm reading that right, K480. This does have a simulated gelatin brain that uses multiple three-axis accelerometers to record impact and compressions to assess brain injuries in spaceflight passengers. So this is one of the SLI competitions. The other thing I noticed with this rocket has an incredible paint job on it. And I actually saw some etching in the fins of a pattern. So it's got a really cool hot rod paint job theme to it. It's even got flames on there. Saw some metallic paint into it. I don't know who on that team is a master painter, but they've definitely got the style points figured out. Okay, we will go to pad 65. We're going to launch Mind Blown Aerotech K480. Thumbs up for the clear sky. Clear range. We're going to launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Nice little bit longer burn on that. Again, this is supposed to simulate the brain, so I didn't need to take off as fast or as punchy. That's why they chose that motor. We have an event. Hopefully the brain is still okay. Not a real brain, it's just a simulated gel brain. Main is set for 700 feet on this rocket. You can see that nice reflection. It's got a really good paint job, nice clear coat finish to it. And this does have the three axis accelerometers to record and measure the impacts and compressions on the simulated gel brain. And this one is kind of coming towards us at the LCO desk. Main is set for 700 feet for this rocket. We're about 1,000 feet up right now, coming up on 750 right there. And then there's their backup. So we have the wind going off to the west a little bit, so hopefully that helps us a little bit, keeps it over in the wheat. Got to watch this one a little bit, make sure it's... So you can see when it shifts directions pretty quickly, that's the surface level winds taking effect of it. But that's a definite good looking textbook flight. Nice job, team. And it is down. Okay, on pad number 80, we have University of North Dakota, and this says University of North Dakota at a Grand Forks, North Dakota. The name of this rocket, I 
I think it says just Mike. I think the name of the rocket is Mike. 37 pounds, 6 inch in diameter, almost 10 and a half feet tall. And this says we have a payload that ejects specifically from the rocket. The projected altitude is 6,000 feet, but they're thinking it's going to do 5,925 feet with the current wind and how it's pointed down range. It does have a Hawk telemetry system that utilizes a three radio system to triangulate rocket location. One radio in a rocket, one radio separating payload, and one at the base station. Uses shielded antennas to find angles. And they actually did uh, paint on the side of the rocket. They did paint their Instagram handle, so they wanted to make sure everyone was following their Instagram. The rocket was also originally red, but for being North Dakota, they wanted to change the colors and paint it green. Okay, on pad number 80. Oh, and this is flying on an l 1420 red line, main set for 600 feet. Pad 80, we are going to launch Mike. Clear sky, clear range. We will launch in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. There it goes. I don't think that's going to go 5,900 feet. That's probably more of a 3,500, 4,000 feet. It is already arcing over. There's an event. There's its backup. Parachutes out. And so the main on this one, again, is 600 feet. And the, there is a piece that does separate from it, and it is supposed to do that. Oh, okay. It's about 2,000 feet right now. It's coming in at 1,000 feet, probably 750. We should be 600 here about now, so we should see an event. There's 600 feet. So again, there's a part that separates from it. That's what it's supposed to do, but it's kind of coming in pretty quick. I don't think it's supposed to do that. Mm, there, I don't know if there's anything under that parachute, but uh, that a little bit of a healthier landing, but still is down. Okay, this is one of the last rockets for this round of flying. The name of this rocket is called Rocket Royals 2.0. This is Victory Christian Center School out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, this team is pumped. They're already excited. It hasn't even taken off yet. I love it. Love the energy. The name of this rocket is Faith 2.0. Weighs 24 pounds, 4 inches in diameter, is 9 feet tall. This rocket does have a comparative analysis of seeds that run in hydroponic conditions after exposure to higher altitude and pressure. They will, grow, they will measure the growth rates and the change based on the culture and the ones that were exposed to the altitude. Projected altitude on this one is 5,800 feet. And this rocket is flying on a Cesaroni K1440. The other thing with other thing with this rocket, they did call it Faith 2.0. Faith 1.0 didn't do as well, so they just did a new one, called it Faith 2.0. I also did see with this rocket, it has thimbles as its charge wells. I've never seen that. I've seen a lot of unique things for charge wells, never seen thimbles used. It did kind of look like engine nozzles that were in there. I know this team put a lot of hours in this project, and it is made up of middle schoolers and high school students that were advisors to it. I also thought it was really cool with this project. The mentor of the group wanted to be an astronaut. Well, this is pretty darn close to being an astronaut, being out here today and mentoring this team. Did a lot of driving back and forth to make this initial 
flight, and they had a lot of help and assistance on painting and finishing, whether it was their parents, students, and even the maintenance person for the school helped and assisted in getting guidance on paint. So we are ready to fly Faith 2.0 on pad 81. Clear sky, have a thumbs up. Clear range, we will launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. That one went instantly. That one really wanted to take off. I don't even think I got to ignition yet. Supposed to go 5,800 feet. It might be doing that. Starting to arc over. That one I did not see an event on it. Does anyone have an eye on that one? Is this, does anyone still see that one right now? This one might have had a very high rate of descent, and I believe it might be down already. Range is open. Again, just a reminder in recovery, don't need to send out the whole team to get the rocket. Just get the team members that you need for recovery. Just get the ones you only need. And then also, once recovering, make sure you turn off your transmitters for the recovery. So you, if you're on 915, you want to make sure you get your transmitter turned off upon recovery. Range is open.
Good afternoon. I am Tracy Washington, and we are here live at Bragg Farms for the 2022 student launch. I have with me Mike Kincaid, who is the Administrator for Education here at NASA. Mike, tell us about you and uh, your experience here so far. Hey, thanks, Tracy. I'm so glad to be here. This has been so exciting. My first mm -hmm. time to come to see Student Launch Initiative. So fun to see the students from whether it's middle school students or college students. So fun to see their work in action. Yes, absolutely. So again, it's so good to have you. I know you're at headquarters, right. so you traveled all the way down I here did. to Alabama to be with us. Um, Mike, talk to um, our, our folks here today about Artemis Generation and how that connects to the Student Launch Initiative. Yeah, right. So it's so cool to be able to see what's going on here because this is just one of many different ways that students can get involved. As you know, Tracy, there are students all across the country. What I love about SLI is that we have students, it's not just something in Huntsville or just something in Houston or Florida, mm -hmm. anybody can get involved. And the fact that we have students that have come from different backgrounds, different experiences, and, and if they, people go to stem.nasa.gov, you can learn more about other ways that students can get involved. I'm excited. Your question is about Artemis. You know, this summer we'll be launching the first vehicle in yes. 50 years. Yes, this is so exciting. It sure is. And, and the, the idea that we'll have the first woman and the first person of color yes. eventually land on the moon. To do that, we have to have students from all different kinds of backgrounds participating yes, with do. us. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to have you join us. There's something called the Artemis Learning Pathways. It comes out every Tuesday for educators to find out what's going on. And it's a great way for them to, to follow us at home. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Mike, talk to me just from the standpoint of being an observer here. Oh, yeah. How, I mean, I know it's amazing, right? It's, it's, it's so cool. And it's such a beautiful day today. <laughs> it's so, yeah. um, talk to me about some of the things that you've seen. What have you learned? Um, what's been your best, what's been the best part of student launch for you so you, far? You know, I'm so glad you asked that question, Tracy. So I brought my 13 year old daughter with me mm -hmm. and we came here yesterday and we were visiting with the teams as they were frankly a little nervous about getting their rockets ready, right? Yes. Some of them were like, we don't really want to talk to you right now. They were very polite, <laughs> but they're like, very we're good. focused. Mm -hmm. And then some of them had a chance to visit with my daughter daughter to talk about their perspectives and so to to come experience only not only as myself but yes. to see how she sees it yes. what a fun thing to be able to see I wish everyone who's watching us at home had a chance to come out here and see yes. the passion and the energy that these students bring yes. uh, and like I said before it doesn't always work the way we want to yes you know some of these rockets didn't land where we expected but we learn more from uh, the challenges, I think, sometimes than the easy ones. Absolutely. Th these are words of inspiration. We learn more from the challenges. Amen. Okay, don't forget that. Um, so last question for you, Mike. I just know that there are people at home that are watching. Uh, there are young students. There are maybe older people who are wondering, how do I get involved with NASA? How can I get involved with um, things like this, mm -hmm. uh, what advice can you give to them? Thanks, Tracy, it's a great question. Again, I, I always like to talk about stem.nasa.gov because you can find all kinds of information. And I also mentioned something called NASA Express. Mm -hmm. It comes out every Thursday, 56,000 people get it. It gets all the different ways that you can get involved in STEM engagement at NASA. Mm -hmm. You know, Student Launch Initiative is one that, you know, we're, we pretty lo we love, yes. but there's so many other ways that people can get involved and uh, we'd love to have you join us and be part of the NASA community. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much, Mike, for, for being here with oh, my us pleasure. and uh, for talking with us today. Again, we are live for the Student Launch Initiative here at Bragg Farms, uh, just north of Huntsville, Alabama, uh, for the 2022 launch. This is amazing because we've been here so many years yeah. doing this. We've yeah. seen new teams, we've seen teams that have been back time and time again. Uh, continue to join us as we do some student interviews here in just a little bit and uh, I'll kick it over to you guys uh, before we go to break. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tracy.
Hi, welcome back to Student Launch 2022. I'm Kay Anderson with Northrop Grumman, and I'm here with Jill Eskew, also Northrop Grumman. And we were just comparing notes to try to remember how many years we've been coming out to this event. Jill, what year did you pin down? I think I started coming around out around 2012, 2013. So it's been a few years. Just a few. And what, what are some of your more vivid memories over the years? Wow, we have had so much variable weather. We're in North Alabama, and so April in North Alabama can be freezing or it can be sweltering. And so we have been out here, I think the last time we were out here, it was just barely above freezing. So we were really cold. We've been out here when it was just a torrential downpour beforehand, and we had yep. inches of mud caked on our feet. Um, today, it has been incredibly windy, so we're all very wind blown. And we had an event today as a result of the wind. One of the rockets came down and actually uh, smashed through a team van window. <laughs> so that will be a memory for that team for sure. Yes. So. Um, you do a lot of STEM outreach, and I know we really appreciate the, your efforts with students. Um, tell us about Northrop Grumman's role and sponsorship, though, with this event. Right. So Northrop Grumman has been sponsoring this event since 2007. We became the premier sponsor in 2008, but at that time, we were ATK, and then we became Orbital ATK, and then we became Northrop Grumman. So it's the same company, but our name has changed. But we've been loving that sponsorship and <laughs> plan to keep doing it. We do. It's our favorite event every year and just glad to be in person this year. I think I've said that every time I've talked. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, why this kind of event is so important for students. I think this event is so incredible because it mimics so much of real life. Whenever you have a complex program, everything is hinged off um, technical competence. And this gives the students a real um, opportunity to use what they've learned. But the other thing you have to have is good communication. If you're the smartest engineer in the entire world and you can't share what you know, does it really matter what you know? And in here, they have to go through the same reviews that we go through with our big SLS rocket. So they go through a preliminary design review, a critical design review, a flight readiness review. And what that tells them and how that mimics what we do is we have to tell our customer that what we're giving them meets the technical requirements for what they're asking for and meets the safety requirements. So that communication is really important. And I think the third thing is teamwork. Um, Teamwork has to be excellent to do anything complex. We have component teams. We have component teams that have to integrate together to make the SLS rocket. And then you have to have even various companies integrate together to make that whole SLS vehicle. And these students get to experience the same thing because on launch day, you either all fail together or you all launch successfully together. And so that's what teamwork's about. It's really helping each other out. Yep, that's awesome. Thank you for that perspective. You yeah. mentioned just a little bit ago that Northrop Grumman makes a rocket motor that's really similar to the rockets we're seeing today. Right, so Northrop Grumman makes a lot of solid rocket motors in various sizes, but somebody had mentioned, well, do you make any this size? And, and we do have several motors in the tactical area that may be around this size, but one of the mo more interesting motors we're working on is the Mars Ascent vehicle. And that vehicle will be what um, return samples from Mars, and it will be the first rocket to launch off of another planet so that's kind of exciting that's crazy and that's really super interesting yeah and so thank you Jill for sharing your perspective thank and you we'll talk to you later all right thank you Kay <laughs>
in the nose cone in. Oh, we're out. Hi. Sorry, we were just talking away. Um, <laughs> sorry, we're here with Izzy. You guys are from Yamhill High, and that's in Oregon, right? Yes, Yamhill Carlton High School. Cool. And this is, I'm going to call it the Young Frankenstein um, rocket because it's it had a brain inside it. Um, not a real brain, though, right? Is that right? No, it is a kind of like ballistics gel. It's gelatin and agarose. So what were you doing with that? other than launching it into the air. So we're concussion testing in rocket flight because as passengers are starting to be in rockets more often, doing these tests can help be helpful. So we decided that we were going to put three axis accelerometers inside of ballistics, a ballistics gel like material and test to see what the likelihood for traumatic brain injury and um, Di diaxonal injury? I forget how to say it. But um, two different types of energies. So one's more of compression. That's the one inside the brain. So we're going to put in vectors and ton of mathematical stuff to figure out how much that brain compressed. And if it's in with, within a certain amount, then that causes a concussion. And we're also putting a sensor on our um, 3D printed canister that is holding the brain, and that's testing for a traumatic brain injury. So that one's just flat numbers, and we're using similar mathematics that they use when they're testing concussion risk in cars. Oh, cool. Okay, awesome. And so, did that affect the way that you? I mean, did, did that affect like your launch velocities and any of that kind of stuff? Did you? I mean, uh, there's several of the rockets that we talked, we saw that were like launched that really they, they really took off. Did you guys slow it down any, or were you? Did you take that into consideration? Yeah. So we use the K480 motor, and that has a very low thrust to try to simulate as close to actual rocket flight as possible. Uh, human rocket flight. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, do you guys have any any sponsors? Anybody you guys want to thank? Um, so Slater Machining, um, big thank you to them. Breaking Bad Science, a podcast, a uh, big thank you to them. We actually have an episode on their podcast, cool. so go watch it. Awesome. Um, so painting is Kylie's dad. He <laughs> helped us out major. Yeah, yeah. So Kylie also helped out with that and everybody on the team, really. If you, if, you, if you can't see that from home, it's a really gorgeous paint job. It really is. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody, wave at the camera. Wave back home. Say hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Right. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Is this your guys' first time here, or you get, you've been here before? So this is your first time? Glad to see you here. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see you again here next year. Landing on it. Awesome. Great. Hey guys, it's Tracy again. 
Here I have two amazing young ladies uh, that are working here at NASA. I have a student who is currently an intern and someone who has interned with NASA previously. So ladies, introduce yourselves and tell us about your internship experiences. Hi, I'm Alyssa Lee. I work at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center now. I am the SLS social media lead. And um, I have been interning since 2017 and just now got a full-time position this year at 2022. So Congratulations. It's been, thank you. It's been an amazing experience. I think um, my internships truly did lead to my full-time job here. So it's been a great, great experience overall. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Bree Sims. I'm a communications intern here at Marshall this spring. And it's been a lot of fun, but this has definitely been the highlight of my internship. Getting to come and see everyone in person and see everything happening has been a lot of fun. That's awesome. So, ladies, you know, this is, this is very good. I'm glad that we're talking. NASA is a technical organization, right? We're here at the student launch. A lot of people think that if you want to work for NASA, you have to be a scientist or an engineer. Tell me about your educational backgrounds and what exactly you did in your internships in that area. Absolutely. Well, I have a bachelor's in public relations and I have a master's in strategic communication. So I'm in the communications realm at NASA. and. Communications is so important here at NASA. We have very science and technical things that we have to relay to the public. So being able to have a communication background and being able to relay that science information out in an understandable way, it's, it's so important, you know? And so in my area, we've done everything from graphics to photo to just social media, tweeting out stuff. So it's very important to have communications and, and arts and so many other fields other than just STEM fields. Yes. Yeah, so I just finished my junior year at UAH in marketing. Um, and I've been working with um, Student Launch and Herc with their different social media channels. And I just think it's super important that people know that you know, STEM, it, our NASA is not all just about STEM. People in communications and marketing, they have a place here at NASA. And if you want an internship and an opportunity, like apply, there's, there's places for you here at NASA. And I think we're proof of that. You guys are, you ladies are absolutely proof of that. Last question for you all. Uh, if you had to give one piece of advice to people listening, that say, you know what, I think I might want to be an intern at NASA. What advice would you give them? I would say just don't give up on that dream. I mean, the whole reason that I even thought about an internship at NASA was because I watched the movie Hidden Figures. And that movie inspired me to apply. And I never thought in a million years that I would get accepted. And I sure did. I got a call and got accepted, came here, and it was a dream come true. So I think it's just don't give up. You may think there's no way they would accept me. Well, you're wrong. There's so many people here at NASA from so many different backgrounds and fields. So just keep trying. Yeah, I would say, like I said, um, just apply, you know, network yourself and meet people in the community and apply because you never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Ladies, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Congratulations on being offered an internship for NASA and uh, congratulations again on the great work that you've done. Uh, so uh, to all my young people out there uh, who are aspiring to work for NASA, visit intern.nasa.gov if you are interested in applying for internship opportunities. There are multiple sessions for internship opportunities. There are sessions in the spring, summer, and fall. And so if you're interested, once again, you can visit intern.nasa.gov to apply for opportunities across the United States. We have multiple NASA centers. And I think that you told me earlier, you actually have experience at Marshall now mm -hmm. and previously at Armstrong, right? Yes, I do, and I've actually visited seven different centers. So That's awesome. And they all have such a wide area like to cover, so each center has their own specialty. It's really great. 
That's great. So again, if you're interested in working for NASA, you can absolutely visit intern.nasa.gov to have similar experiences to the ladies that I've talked to here. We also have the Pathways Internships Program. You would visit usajobs.gov to apply for those opportunities. Thank you ladies again so much. I'm so happy to have you all here and participating in the internships program and developing your skills and experience experiences for the future of NASA. Thank you. Thanks again.
All right, so we're back again here at uh, at uh, Student Launch to, uh, 2022, and we are with Portland Rocketry, and I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves so just right here. Hi, my name is Nivid Singh, and I'm a co-captain on this team. And uh, I'm Matthew, and I'm also a co-captain of this team. And so you guys have already launched, right? You launched in the last volley? Yep. How'd it go? It went really well. We um, There's a few things that we can learn from. Our parachute didn't deploy all the way, which uh, we analyzed why that happened, and that's a great learning experience for us. But um, other than that, it was a great flight. It went straight up and it was just as we expected. Okay, good. Awesome. And what was your payload? Uh, our payload was just tr uh, tracking the location of the rocket using a GPS. Uh, so yeah. And uh, what was your what was the what was the altitude you guys were shooting for? Uh, we were shooting for 5,000 feet, and it only went 4,500 feet, which um, we think that we could figure out why that happened later at home using simulations and using other data that we gathered today. So you guys did gather a lot of data then. Awesome. Yep. Is there anybody you guys want to thank from back home or any sponsors or anything? Uh, we want to thank our parents for making the trip out here, sponsoring us and helping us out with everything. We want to uh, thank our coach, John. Um, not sure exactly where he is, um, but he helped us a lot this year. This was our first student, um, student launch, so he helped us a lot with the building and with the buying and basically with almost every part of our rocket. And then we also want to thank our mentor, George, for spending a lot of time. Uh, he drove out two or three hours to go to launch fields with us and he um, helped us out a lot throughout the journey. Excellent. Will you guys be back next year? Uh, that's our hope. Good. Yeah, that's our goal. Good. All right, well, congratulations, guys. Oh, we got the we got the fans here too. They're hanging out for this one. Okay, the booster part is just about to touch down and all pieces are down. So I found my little note sheet. I must have folded it in two small pieces in my pocket. So with North Carolina, yes, so that was, yes, they had the water ground station. Oh, the thing that I found interesting about Tacos Lycos, that does translate to Speedy Wolf. And you should ask the team about the screwdriver in their body too. So that's, uh, that was interesting. Make sure they gotta check for their tools. And I've seen a lot in my lifetime, but I've never seen the size of a screwdriver one of the team members is carrying. It's like a three foot long screwdriver. The other note about the, about the group, they have something called Joseph's Mallet. So I guess when something just doesn't go their way in terms of building the rocket, 
just grab Joseph's mallet. There we go, folks. Just one more rocket, so it looks like University of Tennessee, Chattanooga has already got the rocket on the pad. It's got it pointed up right now, going through all of their payload safety checks and making sure that's all good, but it looks like it's going pretty good right now.
2022 SLI, new SLI rocket competition. This is an exciting time, so this is our last rocket. The team name is Rocket Mox from the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee. The name of this rocket is Wiley E Rocket. It's a 48.9 pound rocket, not quite 49, 7.68 inch diameter, 10 and 3 quarters feet tall. This is flying on a Cesaroni L1115. This rocket does have a feather, or like, oh, um, feature matching using SIFT algorithm and uh, Burke force calculations, whatever that means. So this rocket has had, and, and with the team, they've been working all night the past three nights on getting this rocket prepared to fly. And I did like the name, the Wiley E rocket, hence the dynamite stickers on there. That's uh, the Roadrunner and the Coyote, if, uh, if anyone knows what that's referring to. Blue rocket with a um, yellow section and black nose cone. And Tommy? Tommy's actually going to push the button. He does have the hard hat on for extra insurance. I think that's a smart move, Tommy. We have thumbs up for clear skies. We have a clear range. and looks like everyone's standing. They're all excited to watch this rocket go. We are going to launch this rocket in five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Come on, come on. Missy, there it goes, there it goes. Woo! It's supposed to go 4,800 feet, starting to arc over. There's an event. We have two different sections. Is that supposed to be? Oh, they are connected. We have a drogue parachute out. That's looking good. All right. Got one person happy about it. <laughs> okay, there we go. The main on this one is set for 800 feet. Does have a tele GPS and an Adafruit RF Max. So we're probably about that 1,500 foot mark, coming up on 1,000 feet. So here pretty soon, we should be at 800 feet right about now. There it is. All right. That is a nice way to finish the 2022 SLI and USLI competition here at the Bragg Farm. So nice work, team. Nice work, uh, competitors. It was fun and exciting to see all the cool projects that you had and able to turn those uh, scores in. Really exciting stuff to see. So hopefully you are further inspired to do more with rocketry. And with the rocket as it touches down, it looks like we conclude the event. So nice work, everyone. Congratulations. And that is a wrap for uh, student launch here in North Alabama 2022. Uh, that just leaves us to thank pretty much everybody who's involved. We want to thank all the volunteers who were here to uh, to help us with all of this. Uh, we certainly want to thank all of the sponsors, and I'm gonna. That's why I have this iPad with me right here, and I'm gonna read those off right now. Uh, we want to thank the NASA Office of STEM Engagement, uh, Next Gen STEM. We want to thank NASA's Space Operations Mission Directorate, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, the National uh, National Space Club at Huntsville, um, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, National Association of Rocketry, Relativity Space. Bastion Technology Incorporated and Siemens Digital Industries Software. Um, just uh, just another uh, little word that the, there will be an awards ceremony. Um, it will be in June, uh, and we look for that online. Uh, other than that, that's a wrap-up for today. Thank you for joining us this year.